G'day. How's everyone going? I'm just going to adjust the camera a little bit there. I'll just adjust my stance. Yeah, that's easier. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> well, I well, hope everyone's uh, safe and well out there. Welcome to another Great and Great live brewing demo. Uh, my name's Joel. I spend most of the stream behind the camera uh, doing stuff on the computer. Uh, and today we are here to watch this guy, Ben, brew a beer that arguably is probably one of the I don't know, the, one of the more popular or most popular styles yeah, that has been invented I, I, I in recent history? They're really dominating the tap lists at the, like, for the last few years. So, um, And, and there's, I, I guess, like there's kind of different ways of approaching it and, and um, I think there's, there's definitely ways to do them wrong. <laughs> um, so, so hopefully we can kind of go over a bit of that today and um, and yeah, learn, learn a bit about about some some hazy boys. Yeah, and maybe raise some hackles too. It's one of those. Oh, for sure. That, yeah, <laughs> people either love them or hate them. So uh, if if you hate them, let us know right in the chat there. Uh, or if you love them, uh, we want to see uh, lots of comments today. Um, oh, there will be. There uh, will be. The yeah, people are gonna yeah. People going to disagree with eighty percent of what I say. Today. By all means, uh, yeah. By all means, feel free to disagree, uh, but keep it civil. <laughs> We're all here to have fun. Um, so, I think without further ado, I might uh, get out the way yeah, and let we'll you some, do your thing. Get some things happening. Cool, cool. All right. No dramas. Um, yeah, so, um, Neepers. <laughs> Hazy IPAs. Um, there's, there, there is a bit of a, bit of a trick to them. Um, it's, Sorry, I just wait for the trolley. I um, mean, in, in a lot of ways, it is um, kind of, I wouldn't say the opposite to the Hellas we did last week, but you, you kind of wouldn't be too far off calling it that. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I think you're uh, fairly safe saying that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess your yeah, Hellas is, is sort of, you know, one grain, one hop, um, very simple recipe wise um, and it's more about the techniques the um, like your temperatures your timings that side of things which which makes a good hellas um, whereas with the new style is it's a lot more about what you're putting into the into the mash tun into the kettle um, and into the fermenter and when as well um, so the the ingredient choice or the like the way that you kind of craft the recipe is really critical oh. sorry <laughs> shenanigans going on in the background oh um we're good um yeah so so um and it really starts right from the water so <laughs> um the getting the water profile right in this sort of beer i think is really critical um to getting the type of bitterness that you're chasing so there's a bit of a not misconception i don't even know if it's like a well like commonly held view but um there's an idea that neepers have less IBUs or are less bitter than other types of IPAs. And, and, and that's not really true. Um, you still want to get a similar kind of IBU level to what you would in a standard kind of West Coast IPA. Um, I say standard because obviously there's a lot of IPAs out there that are like 3000 IBUs. Um, but you, you want to get a kind of similar, um, similar amount of, I summarized alpha acids in the beer. Um, as you would a normal IPA, but the way that the beer is kind of constructed changes the perception of that bitterness. So the bitterness is still there to balance everything. Um, and, it, and it does still assert itself, but it, it is softened by, um, by some other things. And, and I guess one of the first things um, which goes into producing that softened kind of bitterness is the water chemistry. Um, so we talked a little bit about this sort of stuff um, in other demos. Um, I think there are plans in the long term um, to, to get some kind of basic water chemistry um, 
video up on the YouTube as well. Um, it's, it's a little bit more scripted and a little bit less me just like one of us sort of presenters just kind of jazzing it. Um, but you don't have to go too complicated with it. Um, it. It's something that I think scares a lot of people, um, but you don't have to have like crazy levels of chemical knowledge or anything. I definitely don't. Um, just doing the basics and getting the ratios right is really, I think, um, what, what you should be shooting for. So like nailing your pH, getting your chloride to sulfate ratio right. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of water. Actually, I've got water here. I can use that. I don't even have to leave the camera. That's handy. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of water in here um, into my salts so that I can dissolve them because they uh, go into the overall water a lot better when they're dissolved. Use my, um, my finger to stir. The amount, the amount of uh, hand sanitizer that's going on these bad boys lately, I'm probably adding a little bit of extra ABV into the beer as well. Um, so mixing that up, I'll add it in. Um, so when you're playing with water chemistry, you do sort of want to um, you do want to base it on your water, your starting water. Um, so the water that we use here uh, is comes from Altona. Um, so our sort of local water supply, City West Water, has a water quality report. Um, that they publish on their website, um, and I can pull that up, go to the Altona um, section, they've got it listed by suburb, and I can figure out the levels of different minerals like calcium, chloride, sulfate, magnesium, um, that are in the water, um, and then I can kind of base any calculations and any, um, any sort of adjustments and things like that on those numbers, um, and that's what I've done, basically. Um, so rather than me saying you need to put this many grams of this salt and this many grams of this salt into your water to get a good NEPA, it's better to think about it in terms of ratios. So I like to go about a 10 to 1 ratio of chloride to sulfate. That's quite intense, like that's quite a big ratio. It's, yeah, it's um, fairly unusual to sort of have that, particularly in a hop driven beer. Um, but I just find that, th that having, so sulfate tends to bring out the sharpness in, in your beers and, and kind of highlight the bitterness and push it to the forward and put an edge to it. Chloride tends to focus, like kind of help bring up the malts a little bit more, but it also has like a bit of a, a muting effect, I think, on the sharpness of the bitterness. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do. I want the bitterness to be there, but I don't want it to bite. I don't want it to kind of be sort of I'm a musician, I'm thinking in terms of, of audio, like I don't want the highs, I want, I want to kind of like really sort of low mid, like a low mid kind of, um, kind of hum going on with, yeah, the, with so, the bitterness. Yeah, so, so Nipah is I guess known for, I guess we'd call it a soft bitterness, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, not a sharp, punchy, you know, you want, you want it to be like a smooth transition from you want to Great get all the fruit flavours and all the know. hops and all the, you want the malt to be there and you want the bitterness to be there, but you don't want it to be like the main thing that's slapping you around. Like in a West Coast IPA, yeah, you want that bite. You want to sort of, um, you want your tongue to sort of suffer a little bit. It's like eating yeah, spicy food. Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Whereas with a, with a Nipah, you want to enjoy and experience the flavours of the hops and have it balanced with the bitterness, but you don't want the bitterness to be the main focus of the beer. So, so that, that's what having this water ratio kind of does. It, it helps to facilitate that process. And there's other things as well, um, which we will go into as we sort of chug along. Um, but a lot of those, um, a lot of the choices we make are kind of aimed at achieving that. On, on, on that ratio. So would you use ratio ver as opposed to parts per million when working out this, the, the chemistry? That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you let that dictate the... And, and, and again, this isn't like a hard and fast correct approach. This is the approach that I take um, and, and I get good results with it. Um, I know some really, really good brewers who make amazing neepers take a different approach and that, that's not to say that one's right and one's wrong it's just um, there's different ways of, of getting the same outcome yep or similar outcomes got it um so 
And uh, just uh, uh, quickly, we've got Isaac has given you a shout out. Oh, cool. uh, he's saying thanks for hooking him up with uh, some super pride this week. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, top customer service. Thanks for going above and beyond. No, no worries. So there you go. It's what we do. What we try to do. It's, it's, it's getting more and more challenging at the moment. At the so moment, I'm, yeah, we. we, we yeah. Like I think Oz posts um, at the moment on their website are saying about five days for express post. Yeah, right. Um, so you can imagine what that means for regular post. Um, so we're, we're doing our best to get things out to you guys as, as quickly as we can, but um, yeah. but we are at, at the whims and mercy of of the carriers. But um, yeah. We, we're doing our best. Thanks for everyone's patience. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get the grains in there because we're, we're sort of chugging along time-wise. And um, it is going to be a lot shorter brew than the Hellas was. The Hellas had like five different mash steps and things like that. This is a single <laughs> yeah, right. infusion. This, so this is a, this is a single infusion. Um, yeah. I guess we'll go into that later. But um, Yeah, basically because... Um, it's less about the technical aspects of the mash for this beer. It's, it's more about the ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, like I said, al almost the opposite of the halus. It, it's the things you put into it are more important than what you do with those things Got up it. to the point it hits the fermenter. Then it kind of changes around a little bit. So I'm just going to slice this open with these scissors. Normally, I just poke my fingers through it and rip big jagged holes in it. Yeah, I was going to say, you bought scissors today. Uh, they just happen to be there. <laughs> um, and the big jagged holes make for difficult pouring. Aha! Just before we started, I said, I know I've forgotten something. I forgot a paddle, but that's all right. We've got paddles behind that screen. So Use your cool. hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a real brewer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to pour this grain in. Um, and I won't be breaking it up as I pour it in because I don't have my paddle handy, but that's okay. I think it'll be all right. I'll just give it an extra good stir when I'm done. And then once we've got it mashing, we will talk a bit about, you know what I did? I forgot to start the, um, the brew, the recipe on the Browmeister. Oh, I was okay. like, oh yeah, I'm at temp, I'll just pour the grain in. <laughs> um, hopefully that'll just be all right. that, that's, uh, that's pretty easy to fix though, isn't it? Hopefully, the old brow. hopefully an easy fix. Time will tell. And this is a bit of a quirky recipe too. Um, again, I'm sort of doing some weird things. And like I said, this is by no means the one correct way to do this. Um, it is just the way that I do it. And it is a, a way that works, basically. Um, I'm gonna grab a paddle quickly. I'll just disappear behind the screen. And he's gone. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I just posted a message in the, the chat there for anyone who, here I am on screen. Uh, let's have a bit of a discussion. Anyone else out there love their neepers or, or hate them? Uh, I know there's probably a few of you out there. Uh, let us know. We don't we don't shy away from uh, anyone who isn't a fan of a particular style. I think that's part of the fun of brewing. Really, is we all have our um, pet peeves or the things we like, the things we hate, style-wise. Controversial um, style. Controversial. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love I love a good whinge about this and that. You know, I was I was playing in punk bands before I got into brewing, so you know, shying away from controversy is a not really in my wheelhouse. I don't really see why Nipa is a controversial style though. I, like, I guess there are bad examples of it, right? That are full of like yeast bite and hop slurry and all yeah, sorts of sure. gross things. And if you've had a couple of those bad examples and you're basing your opinion on of the style on those, mm. I can understand why you'd be really annoyed and confused as to why everyone's going nuts over them. I think that happened with me uh, with black IPAs. I just had a whole bunch of bad ones in the beginning when they kind of exploded and I think 
bad black eye for you. <laughs> I would be willing to agree with you there. So, oh, says, to... says me, he was just saying, well, I don't know why people are like hating this. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're speaking of styles, I, I, I genuinely do, genuinely do, uh, uh, do not like black eye PAs, but that's just... I have had some nice ones though. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things, um, so um, a lot of the guys here have sort of done the BJCP um, judging course, um, which means that when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> we get to go along to um, beer competitions and, and drink lots of homebrew and critically assess it. The good old days. Um, and you get some amazing beers. Um, there's always that thing of, of people saying, oh, you know, like, Homebrew is better than commercial stuff, and then you kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But some of the beers you have at those competitions are just magic. Um, yeah, it's one thing I've yet to do is really get into the competition side of things. And you can do it um, as a steward as well. Like, they're always looking for people to help out with stewarding, and that basically just comprises of pouring the beers into jugs, delivering them out to the tables, making sure everyone's like, all the judges are topped up with like crackers and palate cleansers and water. And well, yeah, more like once the judging's finished, just like, oh, you guys should have a taste of this one when you, when you get it back over to the stewarding table, so. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely some really, really amazing beers being brewed in, in people's sort of sheds, garages, laundries, wherever, they're, wherever it is that you brew. Um, and they're absolutely every bit as, as good, if not better, than, um, than the commercial offerings in a lot of cases. I mean, there's definitely a lot of really bad ones being brewed in laundries and sheds as well, but... Um, yeah, one or two. <laughs> So right now, you're just giving the mash a gentle stir, breaking up those dough balls. Yeah, just because I, I, didn't, I didn't break it up when I was pouring it in, so I'm yep. just being really sort of mindful to All get right. it out. Because yeah. there is a fair amount of gooey sort of stuff in, in this particular mash as well, so. I was gonna say, so with all that, uh, the wheat or the oats in there, does that mean, make for a bit more of a sticky mash? Yeah, de like definitely will. Mindful. Um, which again is what we want, and we will talk about that in a second once I've got once I've got this stuff in. Um, so I'm about to do something a bit weird. Uh, this is plain flour. Note that I say plain flour and not self-raising flour. This is a very important um, distinction. Um, so self-raising flour has actually got um, baking powder or baking soda, I never know the difference between the two of them. It's got sodium bicarbonate mixed into it. Um, sodium bicarbonate is an alkaline salt and it will mess with the pH of your mash. So if you put self-raising flour in there, you're going to have all sorts of pH issues with your mash. So make sure you are using plain flour um, when you do this. Um, and you can, you can use flaked wheat and it will do pretty much It'll function pretty much the same thing, but I thought we're doing a stream, a bit of theatre, chuck a bit of flour in there. Yeah. It's not that theatrical, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, and, uh, and I'm just popping that. How much did you say was there? Oh, sorry, I don't, I, don't, yeah, um, I don't know if I... Okay. Uh, about 100 ish. 100 grams. What, what did I say? 115 grams, something like that. I do remember. Uh, <laughs> A it, it while was, back, I was paying out once on people who uh, added flour to their mash in meters, uh, and uh, Ben turned around and said, oh, I do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> to quickly backpedal, oh, no, no, I mean, you know, it's fine. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's literally a thing of, like, I heard people were doing it, and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I want to give that a try. And then did it, and it worked. And it worked. And I, uh, yeah. so, uh, I've done it again. Absolutely would. Um, but you do kind of... I don't know whether I should sift it in there. Maybe I should have sifted it in there. I don't really know. I'll help break it up a little bit. Make a roux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wanna, you wanna fry your flour in, in some fat for um, making the best Nipah gravies. Um, so, I'm just mixing it in. So flour is basically just milled wheat, right? But like really finely milled wheat um, that hasn't been malted at all. Um, so what we're really sort of chasing out of that is all the protein, um, all that delicious gluten. 
Um, so this is definitely not a gluten-free recipe. If you're um... <laughs> for all the celiacs out there, we yeah. do apologise sincerely. Uh, we gluten a... is massively our friends in Nipahs. Yeah. Just uh, sorry to interrupt there. We had a question uh, a little while back. I think it was mm -hmm. just a, a quick one. What? How much water are you starting with in the mash today? Uh, so this is a Braumeister, so um, pretty much the answer is going to be the same for most brews, um, which is 25 litres for the 20 litre brows. Um, you need at least that much water to make sure the elements are covered when the pump's running. Um, you can go more, um, and I definitely could have in this, in this instance, but I didn't. Because um, I, I wasn't sure exactly how full um, it was going to be once I added the grains and the flour and everything into it. So, yeah, I've just sort of done the norm. And I will sparge at the end, but I'll sparge cold just because um, one thing about the streaming, um, we've got all these cameras and lights and microphones and things plugged in. Um, there's a little bit less space slash PowerPoints um, to have a second urn plugged in to, to heat up some hot water. So we're kind of, um, I don't really mind doing a cold sparge. They, they've done some studies, I think, that showed that it's, um, sorry, just wander off camera. Um, I'm pretty sure they did some studies a while back that showed that there wasn't a huge uh, loss of efficiency between cold sparging and hot sparging. I guess there's just the energy efficiency loss of um, knocking out some of the temperature. But I, yeah, on that note, I have started cold sparging myself. Just, uh, well, actually, when I do sparge, I've, I've probably started uh, doing no sparge, incorporating that into my brewing more so. But uh, yeah, I, I used to cold sparge when I did it and um, didn't notice a huge difference. That's pretty, yeah, it's pretty. Um, Pretty norm. So I am now starting the recipe on the Browmaster, which I should have done before. Water filled in, pump ventilation. So normally you would do this before adding the grain, but testament to the Browmaster is that you can stuff up even with everything pretty much automated and sorted out for you, but it's, it'll still figure it out. It'll still get it done. Yeah, you wouldn't be the first. I've, uh, I've certainly done it myself. Quite often I just um, wind up putting it all manual anyway and letting it go. So we've kind of started the mash anyway, even if the Browmaster isn't aware of the thing we're doing a mash. Um, the, the water was at temp, um, it's now recirculating, so we're, we're mashing. Uh, temperature reached, fill in malt, malt filled in, and we're gone. Cool, so that was really easy. Um, I'm going to chuck the lid on, because um, that will help it hold its temp. It is a little wonky actually, so what I might even do before we go too much further, Meister on the edge of a not so um, strong table. So I'll just move these things out from behind it and um, slide it back a little bit towards the center of the table. There's my little hobby boys. Audio. That's alright, apologies for the little camera thing there, I just had to fix something. We're back. I believe that's a little better, maybe. Uh, the table's still a bit wonky. Oh well, doesn't matter, it's, it's there now. We'll, we'll just move it back again when it comes time to um, cubing. Um, and I will pop, pop these things back up. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, yeah, what could possibly go wrong, right? And this can stay under there. That can stay under there, that can stay under there. This is riveting viewing, I'm sure. Uh, lid. 
trivet and water. Cool. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically now that's, that's just going to kind of chug away, do its thing. Um, don't really have to do anything with it at this point. Um, it's just a single infusion match. I've hit 67 degrees just to hit, sort of split the difference between beta and alpha amylase, which are your two main um, starch converting enzymes. I don't really want to break down the proteins and things that I've just added. Um, so if I wanted to break them down a little bit, I could have done like maybe like a protein rest at like 50 so degrees, but we, we want the proteins in this beer. Um, it's going to create haze, but more importantly, it's going to kind of give, a, give something for the hop oils to piggyback onto, to keep them in suspension, um, which is what we want. We want, we want those um, delicious hop oils to stick around uh, in the beer um, and, and having extra protein kind of gives them, gives them something to hang on to so that they can do that. Right. So, so, so is, that, is there a definitive answer yet on what creates the haze in Nipahs? I heard there was some the, perhaps uh, When I first looked into it, and to be honest, I haven't looked into it in a while. So there's probably been studies that have been done since I kind of did my initial research a few years ago. Um, but the general consensus among um, people was that it was most likely an interaction between polyphenols and um, proteins um, that was creating that haze. Interesting. So, mm. um, which interestingly is the same thing that creates haze in hefeweizen. So it's, it's sort of often yeah. was said it's the yeast in suspension, but it's not actually it's not um, just the yeast. case. Yes. Yeah, it's just the it's that interaction between the polyphenols and and the proteins um, that that kind of create that. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Um, so we should talk about uh, what grains we've got in there. I guess. Do it. Um, because that, this kind of like stage one in the um, things that are important <laughs> to achieving the style. Um, you can do any number of different configurations um, of grains, um, flavoured in all sorts of different ways, as long as you're hitting a few kind of key points. Um, so I think the, the really important thing that I, I believe from what I've read in achieving a good NEPA, um, and I keep putting these disclaimers in because there's so many different opinions and so many different um, takes on this, but I don't want to come across as like, this is the definitive correct answer. Sure, like with a lot of things, it's, people will find their own method or way that works for them. So uh, yeah, Absolutely. put that disclaimer Absolutely. out of the way. And, and yeah, this is, this is what I've been doing um, and this is what I've been enjoying. In, the, in my beers. Um, so this is kind of, I'm talking from my own anecdotal um, sort of experiments rather than any kind of hard empirical science or anything like that. Um, so you want to have a high fat content and you want to have a high protein content. So it might seem a bit weird to be talking about fat content in beer, but all the, like different grains have different levels of, of things in them. Um, so barley has a fairly low to medium kind of fat content in it. Wheat, similar, but it has a much higher protein content than a lot of other grains. Um, grains like oats and rye have a much higher oil content and that's the fat. That's what we're sort of wanting to um, get in there. Because again, we want to soften the mouthfeel. We want to have sort of like a thick, full, soft, creamy kind of mouthfeel in these beers. And um, having those fats is, is what's going to help us to achieve that. So the way a lot of people go about this um, is just by adding oats, um, adding oats, adding wheat adding flaked wheat to get the protein, um, adding flaked oats. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. 
Um, I'm, just, I'm just doing camera Sorry, stuff just doing a bit of camera, the, camera adjustments in the background. Behind the scenes. Um, and that's something that uh, we do really effectively. So um, the, the Lefty Juicy um, work kit that we sell here, um, kind of loosely based on my initial recipe, um, but we have adjusted it to make it kind of more, I guess, um, like my recipe, the one I'm doing today, it's very sort of niche. It's very kind of tailored to my tastes. Um, we, we've sort of adjusted the, the work kit to be a little bit more kind of generically delicious. And I actually um, kind of feel like the work kit is better than my version um, in a lot of ways. rave about that kit? Um, which is annoying, but... <laughs> <laughs> and um, on that note, I guess too, if anyone's interested in the recipe, we will work out a way to put it in the description for this. Yeah, absolutely. We'll and, and, we can, point. and with any of our work kits as well, um, if you contact us and ask for the all grain recipes of the work kits, um, we, can, we can do that for you really easily as well. Um, so yeah, so this is... So basically with our um, fresh work kit, NEPA, um, it's really simple. It's, it's, Australian pills malt, um, it's a bit of flaked wheat, a bit of flaked oats, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, there's not there's not a lot going on there. Not a, not a complicated grain bill. No, and it yeah. doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, it really it's doesn't not have really to be. Really about the malt, is it? It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, except for that that haze you're trying to. That's probably the main. Yeah, and, and, and it's got the things in there that need to be in there to make a successful NEPA. You've got your protein from your flaked wheat, you've got your fat from your flaked oats, and you've got your fermentability from your pills. And, and that's really all you need for a successful NEPA. And then we just do things like um, pH adjustment in the, in the mash when, we're, when they're brewing the kits to make sure that, um, that we're hitting the right numbers. It's not astringent or anything like that, and we're getting sort of the flavours that we want. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's literally like, if, if you want to do a, like a NEPA with like no bells, no whistles, just like a good, well-executed example of a New England style IPA, that's all you really need to have in there. Um, yeah. Just your fundamentals, just, yeah. just sort of get your fundamentals In terms of it? grains, in terms yeah, of yes, grains. Sure, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have kind of stepped a little bit um, outside of that. <laughs> I've got a little handwritten um, note because um, we've had all the computers updated recently and um, I lost a lot of my old recipes so I've had to kind of look back through my own personal archives and find, um, find things in kind of hardware form rather than software form. Um, but I have followed the same basic premise that I just outlined in that you need a fat content, you need some protein, you need those things. But I've like thought, well, how can I achieve those outcomes whilst also chasing some different flavours and some different kind of characters? Um, so that, that's kind of where my um, sort of home, home brew need for recipe comes from. Um, so I do have oats in there. I've got two different types of oats in there. Um, so I've got... Um, I'll just read out the rest of the basically. So I've got 4.2 kilos of Joe White pills. Um, I use Joe White pills because it's cheap and it's good and it gives me the sugar and the fermentability and all the things that I want from the base malt. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be a fancy base malt. I don't have to use a European pills malt and it, honestly I think it would possibly be a bad choice for this type of beer yep. because European pills malt has a very distinct flavour. Right. Which I don't know will necessarily work in this context. It might do. Yep. Like I said, no right or wrong way. If that's what yep. you want in your beer, that's chuck it in there um, and see what happens. And if you like it, then awesome. If you don't, yeah. then change it for the next time. But, but like you say, almost, or as you were saying earlier, the, the opposite of uh, the, um, the Hellas, yeah, where the it's Hellas all about... Yeah, Hellas all about that European pills malt flavour because it's the only malt that's in there. Yeah. Um, but I know a lot of people make Nipahs with Marisotta as the base malt. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is quite good. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of people like to play around with um, some American malts. Um, there's some really nice, like Gladfield malts, which work really well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the American Gladfield American ale. Yeah, is, is a favourite yeah, malt. The Brace Two Row is really popular in a lot of recipes. Yep, I guess being a style that originated in the States, you, if you wanted to be, you know, uh, really, really true to it, you could use American style malts, but. 
not necessary as you yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely not. And, and I think um, the Australian malts get a bit of a bad rap. And I think part of that stems from the fact, stems, um, stems from the fact that um, people kind of don't like, like the, the, the sort of the imported, the international stuff always has like a veneer. It has a prestige or something or, about it. A, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, prestige That's is probably cool. a better word than veneer of fanciness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it's kind of like, oh, this is imported. It must, must mean it's better. And Therefore, it's not, it must like, be better. I think thinking about ingredients as better or worse is kind of a... I don't. I keep wanting to say wrong, but it's not yeah. right and wrong. But it's. I, I don't think it's a helpful way to think about it. Um, each one of the different malts that we stock has its own unique character, unique flavors, and things that will will bring to your beer. Um, and playing around and trying them out, brewing beers with different ones, and getting an idea of what sort of thing that they're that they're introducing um, helps you when you're designing recipes. Um, to make the right choice for the beer you're trying to make. So like, if, if you're chasing a certain flavor um, and you're familiar with the different base malts on offer, base malt is gonna make up 70, 80% of your beer. So um, picking the right base malt is, is a really um, big part of, of nailing the flavor that you're chasing. So yeah. being familiar with it, with a, with a bunch of different ones kind of helps you make those decisions. And, yeah. and for me, like I, I, I really like the Joe White base malts. I really like the Barrett Burston base malts. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like this country grows world-class grains um, of all varieties, barley, wheat. Um, yeah. And there's something to be said for supporting local, yeah. uh, local Smaller companies footprint. as well, as Isaac um, pointed out. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a small carbon footprint. We're not sort of shipping it all over the world. That said, I'll always use European malt sure. in, my, in my German beers. When you're doing um, and German you beer. can't make an English ale without Marisotta, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. But um, yeah, it's just the right, the right malt for the right beer, I think, is, is the way to think about it. And yeah, I, I reckon the Australian malts work really well for this style. So play with your malts, people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so oats. I've got two different types of oats in this. Um, and it was actually Joel um, who suggested to me when I was first crafting my initial um, pilot batch of, of this yeah, um, that I should chuck in some golden naked golden oats. Golden naked oats, just just because they're awesome, really. <laughs> That's so good. Um, that I think most of us who work here, when we're um, doing like weighing out grains and doing the crushes and stuff in the morning, the golden naked oats are the, the probably the preferred snack. <laughs> like if, you, if you're sort of um, measuring out some grains and you want to sort of just grab a little handful and nibble yeah. on them in the morning, um, just, just little, but bit, when someone's going. doing a golden naked oats beer, you, you definitely um, sneak a few, um, sneak a few into your into your mouth. Yeah, tasty little slackers. Um And they have a really nutty character to them. Mm. And uh, weirdly, I and I've seen this descriptor before. Berry. Yeah, I don't know if you, see you that. get that, but it's like a blueberry or uh, yeah, or boysenberry. Boysenberry, I think. boysenberry yeah, is probably sure. a better one. Yeah, which is it's a, it's a hard one to describe. Which, which sounds bizarre when we're yeah. talking about oats, um, but I, I actually find that oats generally um, will introduce a fruitiness to a beer when you put them in, um, and that's something that you can really play with, and that I have sort of played with a little bit. Um, I saw somebody do a hundred percent oat beer at one stage, which was really interesting. They said it was like so fruity and intense like with those flavors. Yeah. So okay. there's obviously something about the makeup of the kind of components of, of an oat mm. that when fermented Maybe kind of produce these things. Yeah. Um, so, and that also plays into why I don't use Marisotta in mine um, because I'm getting that nuttiness and that sort of biscuitiness from the golden naked oats. So I think if I, if I use the Marisotta and the Golden Naked Oats, that would almost become too much. So sort of like if you ever kind of overdo the sesame oil in a recipe, like yep. a stir fry or something, and it's just, it's all you can taste. Yep. I'm That's kind of mindful point. of going too far with the nuttiness in a beer that should be all about the hops. So, yeah. um, so like it's another good reason to use a good neutral base malt. Yeah. Yeah, with a lot in cooking, you could think of an analogy is you don't, you, too much spice will will become overpowering. You don't if you you know you can taste any one thing. Well, it depends what you're making. I'm generalising, yeah. but uh, you know if you if you can taste too much pepper or salt, you know you've added too much. It should all play, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, smoothly. 
particularly in this style. Except for the hops, which we haven't got yeah. to, but that's a story yeah, yeah, yeah. altogether. No, no, no room for subtlety with hops in this sort of beer. Um, but, and then I've also got malted oats. So it's a little bit um, of a kind of step outside of the norm for the Nipahs. People tend to go with the flaked oats. Um, and there's a good reason for that, you know, like they're really easy to work with. Um, they add protein as well as fat. They, they kind of, um, yeah, it, it's like, it's an easy, it's an easy option um, to, to go with the flaked oats. Um, the reason I've gone with the malted oats is largely because at that point I hadn't used malted oats before and I thought this was a good excuse to kind of play with them. Um, but I feel like they give a different character to flaked oats um, in the beer. Like the, the, there's like an almost perfumey quality to them. Um, and I've, I've started experimenting with them in a few other beers as well. Um, and I get that same kind of character um, in all the beers that I use them I in. Mean, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to describe, um, but it really is almost like perfumey, sort of very floral kind of character from, from the beers that I've put them in. Um, almost like a rose yeah. kind, of, um, kind of scent. Um, and I just think that works really, really well in the context of, of like all these big fruity, floral, hoppy flavours um, to have that kind of subtle, fruity maltiness in yeah, the background. Yeah, anything you can do to sort of... It's all those ways, and, and the berry from the golden naked oats, like all yep. those things are just kind of reinforcing um, that fruitiness in different layers, in different ways. And, and it kind of gives it a bigger, um, bigger impact in, in the end beer. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. And I've got carapils in there just for a bit of extra body. Um, I could probably do without that, honestly. Um, but yeah, for sure, there. you got enough. <laughs> I've got I've got plenty going on there to, 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 in there, to but why not fill out in the mouth feel, But um, it's you know, it's in there. <laughs> and um, and some acidulated malt. Um, that's that's my pH adjustment. Um, so. Yep. Um, I like to use acidulated malt for my pH, um, kind of, or for my initial pH, um, sort of dialing in. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not actually testing the pH today, which is probably a bit naughty, but um, I could. You got the skills to get, to get by. The, the, I, I have gotten lazy as I've gone along because I've found that since I've been using the calculator that I use, which is the one on brewersfriend.com, um, they've got a water calculator there. Yep. Um, using the water quality report and that calculator, I'm never w like outside of like 0.1 of the pH yeah, it predicts yeah. I'm going to get with the malt that I use. So, and that does happen. The, the, the more experienced you get, the lazier uh, one tends to be. You learn where you can, you can. take exactly. shortcuts. Exactly. And, and as long as you kind of check every... So like if, if this was a commercial kind of scenario, obviously you, you're you going to check every little thing and to make sure you've got all your data points lined up. Um, and I could run off and grab a pH meter now. I might even do that in a little bit um, just to see where we're at in the, in the match pH. Um, but I'm pretty confident um, from doing this a lot of times um, that, that I'm going to be where I need to be. So do you find that being a, a light beer with a very light base malt, lots of oats, lots of basically colourless adjuncts in there that you require a significant um, pH adjustment? I chuck in about 100 grams of acidulated. Okay. So it's, you know, it's not an uh, insignificant amount. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe something for people to keep a, an eye out. If you're doing an EPA for the first time, uh, do, yeah, check your pH and just you may need, well, you probably will I, need I, an acid I, I honestly recommend every beer you do yeah. to, um, it doesn't, like, if you've got access to a water quality report for the, for the water you're using, um, it doesn't take that long to plug it into a calculator um, and, and sort of get an idea of what you're going to come out as. It, I think one of the biggest things, particularly with hoppy beers, um, especially since the trend really moved away from, from the, like, in, into, like, the really pale and yep. non- Non like, like light malt character in, in the hoppy beers. Um, it's so easy to stuff up your mash pH um, and end up with really soapy kind of astringent hoppy beers, um, which I think we've all had plenty of. Um, so with any beer you're doing, um, taking that little bit of time at the start 
if you're up to it, just to, just to kind of plug it into a calculator, see what it predicts you're going to get and see if you can make any adjustments to the grist to like adding some acidulated malt in there is a really easy way to adjust your pH without sort of, you know, like going down like the acid and the syringes and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's I've, since I, like when I kind of made that, it's one of those discoveries that when I started doing that with my beers, that was like a big improvement across the board of what I was producing. Um, similar to like kind of when you get temperature control um, and, and you see that massive improvement across the board of every beer you're doing, you're getting consistency, you're getting the right flavours. Um, I found that monitoring pH and, and actively kind of um, controlling it was, was another big one for me in terms of um, just getting the beer I wanted to get at the other end. Um, and it's a pretty simple thing to do. Yep. It's, it's not that. It's, it, a lot of people try to make it sound a lot more complicated than it is because it makes them feel smarter about them knowing about it. Um, it's a bit of a flex. Sure. Sort of drop a bunch of chemistry terms. And, and it can be intimidating for a new brewer. Just the term water chemistry yeah. um, put the fear into me and when <laughs> for a long time. When you're doing your sure. first four or five brews, and there's so much going on that you're trying to yep. keep track of. You just want to nail um, down. You, you just want to be able to first. get the basic mechanics of what you're doing um, sort of under control. But w when you do kind of have those mechanics a little bit more on lock, yep. um, Paying attention to things like that are, are really going to help. And uh, like I say, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So that's yeah, <laughs> really. Uh, I, it, I was <laughs> elated um, when I found out that I didn't need to do any math or science subjects um, from year 10 onwards at yeah. high school. Um, yeah. So I, I instantly dropped them stuff. all because yeah. I was going to be an artist, yeah. not a scientist. Sure, yeah. Yeah, no, me too. Um, and then I went off and studied music at university and all, all of a sudden it's like, oh, so audio is all physics? Oh, that's, oh. Yeah. <laughs> then I go off and become a brewer and it's like, oh, chemistry and physics now? That's, oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that, that's, I mean, what brewing did for me was... <laughs> Wish was, I'd paid a bit more attention to all this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's, it's like anything. If you have an interest in a particular area, you're more likely to absorb the information. And brewing, um, for me, reinvigor reinvigorated a, a joy of science, I guess you mm. could say. Well, I think the deeper you get into anything, it doesn't matter what it is, you hit a point you get, where you, you get into the science. The science is going to happen anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, like even with it, like like I said with the music stuff, you know, you, when we're doing audio and we're talking about waveforms and and all this other stuff. I'm just like, oh, okay. And and just playing music as well, like the whole concept of rhythm. You're literally in real time dividing time itself into like complex fractions and like making all these choices based on that. It's like there's so much mathematical kind of processing going on yeah. with with that. So sure. And, and, you know, visual art, you, you're kind of making decisions based on um, ratios and sizing and, and mm -hmm. depth of field and all those kinds of things as well. It, it all comes back to Not numbers. Not mentioning gear so. too, that, you know, you can get really technical with the equipment know, in, in, any, in any field. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, yep. it, you know, a little bit of basic maths is, is a pretty handy thing to have. Huh. So where were we? I think that's, that's uh, pretty much... Oh, you've much gone through the... Yeah, I went through malt, the grist. And, um, then, and then, yeah, obviously the flour. Um, so the flour, um, you could just use flaked wheat and it would do basically the same thing in this recipe. I, I just liked the idea of putting flour in the beer, so I did it. Um, and I bought it in today just, just as like... It's, I don't think it's as dramatic on camera as it is in person. And I don't even think it's that dramatic, but it's just like, what? You're putting flour in the beer? Um, but yeah, it's literally just milled wheat. So, um, milled unmalted wheat. And that's a way of, yeah, sure, yeah, there you go, there, there, there you go, yeah. So, it's a way of adding haze, yeah. basically. Well, it's, it's just protein. Idea. protein. Just like heaps of protein. Um, and sugar as well, because the enzymes in the grains will convert the starch and the flour into sugar. Um, so, I am getting fermentables out of it. It's not, um, yeah, it's right. not a totally kind of just a uh, pointless yep. endeavour. Yep. And I've only put in like, like I said, like one or, one or 200 grams um, in like a sort of five or six kilo grist. So there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of enzymes um, from the four and a half, five kilos of base mite I put in there to convert it all. Um, 
I mean, when you think about wheat beers, right, you, you're talking half and half unmalted wheat with Pilsner, and it still manages to kind of be a fermentable beer. So, yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can get away with it. Yep. So um, we had a question earlier mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I, I don't know if you're about to, I might be jumping ahead, but no, uh, talk good. about the hops. Um, obviously using a lot of hops and you will be cubing today as well. So, I will, yep. Uh, I cube at all my beers. Yeah, okay, sure. So how does that affect, uh, well, I don't know if you want to answer this question first. Or it's funny first, because it doesn't affect me. Yep. Because I cube all my beers, I've calibrated to that. Got so it. When I, so when I'm um, planning a beer, planning a recipe, um, I know what X I use on the calculator that I use is going to equate to in flavour. Mm -hmm. um, so I make my beers based on how I know from experience they're likely to turn out. Um, a lot of people talk about you need to factor in the time in the cube into your calculations and everything. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're used to not cubing, then yeah, you probably will take a period of calibration where you might add less kettle hops to get the same level of bitterness you're used to. But once you're used to it, you, you just know. You, so, you know what's going to So the answer happen. there is to... Like with any new practice, cubing is something that you probably have to do a few times to dial in, work out. Because it is, I find it's different for everyone. Some people find that there be, I mean, yeah, I think that's a, a subjective thing. People will say that cubing the beer makes it more bitter and, and others that experience is, is maybe not exactly true for them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just yeah, yeah, I guess for doing. me, there's, there's no thing for it to be more bitter than. Yep. <laughs> it's like more bitter than what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah I've always cubed, yeah. so it's sort of like. <laughs> yeah, if you've always done it, it's. Yeah, it's, if, uh, if I, I have done a couple of no, no, like chilled beers. Um, like I did a beer for a friend's wedding a while ago, and then because we were making quite a large amount, um, I didn't have a 60 litre cube handy, so I sort of was running it through the chiller um, as a way to get it down to temp and ferment it. Um, and I, I did sort of find it maybe wasn't as bitter as, as I was expecting it to be. It didn't really matter because it wasn't an overly bitter beer in the first place. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it, it's... But people do, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't different enough for me to be like, oh, wow, like that's quite different to how I expected. It was yep. pretty much what I thought it would be, except maybe slightly less bitter, like barely perceptibly. So, um, yeah. And I didn't have something to compare it to either. Yep. So it was, it was kind of like what I thought it was going to be. It was a little bit less, but yep. I, I don't think it's as big a difference as a lot of people sort of claim it is either, because the, the cube's going to drop down to below 80 degrees reasonably quickly anyway. Yep. By the time you've whirlpooled it, like I try to do a five to 10 minute whirlpool in the yep. kettle, that's going to knock it down to probably early 90s. Yep. So you're um, cubing, yeah, there, so it's already, and that's... And then transferring it through stuff. the hose into the cube is going to knock a lot of temperature out of it as well. So it's probably not going to be sitting in the isomerization temperature yep. range for a super long period of time anyway. And the theory is that at below 80, it drops off pretty much to nil by, by 70, I think yeah. is what my understanding is. So if, yeah, uh, if, yeah, the time between the cube is sitting there between 95 or however much down to 80, uh, you know, you're, you're getting a bit more bitterness, but um, I guess there's a lot of environmental factors that could factor yeah, into like that Yeah, like in summertime, well, but... you might find that it um, changes a little bit. In wintertime, you'll probably find that your cube's down to non isomerizing temperatures within an hour or two, yep. most likely. Yep. And the amount of isomerization that's happening um, at 90 degrees is significantly less than what's happening at 100 degrees as well. Yes, true. Um, yep. So it, it's not like a, a sort of straight line kind of thing. It's yep. definitely a curve. Yeah. Um, um, people do add hops straight to the cube as well. All their which hops is what I'll be end, doing which today. Which you're going to do today. Yep. Okay, so I guess we'll cover that um, when Ben gets to that point. Um, Martin is asking, he's got cubing? Question mark. So yep. I, I assume Martin maybe is not familiar with the, uh, the uh, no-chill <laughs> method. We have a video, um, actually. Where are you um, from, Martin? Just out of curiosity. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a thing here in Australia, but it's possible that you've not heard of it. Um, anyway, but... Oh. Back to the... You're right. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are operating in a, just, in a functioning so a, brew, brew shop as well while we're doing this. So. <laughs> um, so it is a method basically of chilling the wort uh, without using any extra equipment. Well. 
you're using a, a jerry can, basically, um, but you're not using any extra water or a chilling equipment to chill the work quickly. You're, you're doing it Yeah, we, we, we have a lot of um, drought issues in this country. Um, and it, 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 when we're under water restrictions, running a chiller for 20 minutes is a bit of a waste of water. <laughs> Um, so people just started chucking it into food safe plastic containers and letting it cool down naturally over the course of 24 hours or so. Um, and it works fine. Yeah. Um, we get, like we sell a lot of work that we, um, so we, we've got a brewery on site. We pump out about sort of ah. 800 to 1000 litres at a time. Um, and no chill cube, all of that work, and sell it off as fresh work for people to take home and, and homebrew with, um, and we get really good results with that. Um, it's, it's yeah, just a really efficient way of um, of dealing with yeah that. We did make a video um, about it. Martin's um, from Woodend, so he's, he's okay. quite local. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, lovely area. Um, it is, yeah. So yeah, check Great out. We've got a video, Martin, if you want to look at it, um, starring this this <laughs> this guy. I'm just going to go on camera there. That guy right there. Um, uh, if you do a YouTube, just search our channel. It'll be on there. You could you could do a search for um, no chill, the no chill method. We will probably pop up top somewhere. Uh, that'll that'll teach you all you need to know. Yeah. Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's not much to it. Yep, it's pretty easy <laughs> once you get the hang of it. Yeah, run it from your kettle into your cube, put the lid on and then leave it until it cools down. But it's a good method, yeah. And then, you, then you're good to go. Especially for those of us here yeah, in water restricted areas. Um, so hops. Hops. Yeah, uh, well any more it. on that hops? Because um, <clears throat> I mean, like, we, we don't necessarily have to go through the whole, the whole brew day today either. Um, we'll, we'll sort of see how we go. Um, there, there is, I guess, that kind of thing of um, once you've seen a few of these, like if we're going over the same things every single time, then, then it, yeah, they, um, yeah, they yeah we do it. cover a lot of um, the basics in, have covered the basics in streams gone by, mm. um, and and I think there's plenty to talk about with yeah. this as well. Sure. Um, so hop, yeah, hops are obviously a big thing. Whatever. Yeast is obviously a big thing, and I think once we hit the hops, it's kind of the hops and the yeast are really tied together in this style of beer um, because of the way that they interplay. Um, which is fairly unique. Like I, I don't know of any other beer styles up to the kind of emergence of the New England IPA that had the interplay between hops and yeast as such an integral part of the style. Um, so yeah, it, like I guess I guess so. Like and as you were saying, that Hefeweizen and maybe a good yeah, it's good an interesting parallel. one. Well, actually, there aren't really any hops in it, so I forget. I, yeah, it's not an overly hoppy beer. It's not a hoppy beer. Yeah. Forget that. I was just thinking more of the yeast stuff. Um, so, yeah, so it's... You kind of, this is where it kind of does have a tendency to go into some kind of more science-y areas um, with this beer style because it is... The biochemistry of what happens is kind of what makes it that type of beer. So like the the way like the different types of hop oils um, in different types of hops um, and the way that yeast interacts with those and changes them and um, how many of them can stick around for the entirety of the boil versus how many of them kind of drop off fairly quickly like th there's all these different things that come into play um, so the right hop choice I think is really important um, with this beer that being said there are lots of right hop choices. So it's not like if you don't use these exact hops in every beer, it's not going to work. It's more use one of these 15 to 20 different types of hops and you'll be fine kind of thing. Um, and, and that's the case, I think, with a lot of beers. Um, I think there's a tendency, especially when you're first getting started, um, you like doing a brewing to a recipe the recipe calls for a certain type of hops and you start to get worried if you need to start making substitutions, you're using all these different hops. It's like, oh, this isn't, this isn't the beer in the recipe, but it's like, yeah, but, you know, when was the recipe made? Hops are an agricultural product. So um, the Amarillo that he used in 2016 will be quite different to the Amarillo that they harvested mm. in 2019. Yeah, um, yep, that is an important thing to think about. So th there's, there's a lot of kind of, um, emphasis on like the need to use citra or the need to use mosaic or the need, 
but it's a lot of hops have a lot of similar characteristics, they have a lot of similar chemical makeup, and, and you can get really good results using them interchangeably and kind of playing with them. And one year, um, Galaxy might be amazing, the next year it might have dropped off a bit, but say Vic Secret might have come out with an amazing, you know, so like all these, all these sort of year to year that. It is an interesting variable that I didn't realize when I started home brewing how much impact uh, the, well, the, yeah, the, the, I guess you could say, the, use the wine term, the terroir, uh, has an impact on things like hops. They, are, they do definitely change year to year and where they, the region. Paddock is, to paddock. Yep. One end of paddock the paddock to, paddock. to the other end of yeah. the paddock. You know, like there's, there's so much variance. Um, and I think that's kind of a cool thing. Like it's something that Absolutely. we, that I think like we should really be embracing as well. Like, it's, it's so, it kind of, I think the fact that beer has sort of evolved out of such an industrial kind of production method. So like once, once you kind of, your big English breweries sort of started taking off and they were like in the industrial revolution, everything was like mass produced and like to a, an exacting standard and everything. There's, I guess, the culture is to expect the same thing from every can of, of the same beer. Yeah, for sure. That on that macro level as well, where been, we have been so used to for so long about a consistent product, and there is there's certainly an art and um, uh, a lot of uh, impressive engineering has gone into oh, achieving yeah. that. You know, so the beer that you have in. Melbourne is the same beer that you have in Darwin, um, you know, over a, a, a space of time. They, you know, they, and, and, and it's something that the big brewers to expect. Yeah. yeah, and something the big brewers have mastered. And like, you know, a lot in the in the kind of beer scene, in the craft beer scene, especially. I hate that term, but I'm going <laughs> to say it because it's relevant yeah. to this conversation. Um, th there's a tendency to just kind of deride like your VBs and your Carlton drafts and things like that, but those guys are pumping out millions of litres of very, very exact, yeah. um, consistent product. Technical feat. That, yeah. I... Um, and doing that at that level, at that scale, is seriously impressive. Um, like those, those guys know how to freaking sure. brew. Like, yeah. um, but I guess you could say that what it's done is trained, and this is the same for food, I guess in a way as well, like a lot of things that we consume, uh, have been consuming, uh, expecting a level of consistency and that's just normal, that's what things You go to Macca's be. in the Philippines and you expect yeah. the cheeseburger to that's taste been, the same as it does right. in, yeah. But uh, I guess the, you know, with the slow move, slow move, the slow food movement and, and such things that people are now uh, opening up to things being, having a seasonal variability and, yeah. and craft beer uh, is certainly one of those areas that um, in a way you can look at it, it's take starting the wine to shift. world. Yeah. It's starting to shift, but I feel like um, there is still those expectations attached to small breweries well. that like if I get a um, a, a kaiju crush. Yep. I want it to taste like the last kaiju crush I had, had, sort of thing. Yep. Um, and and that is, I think, when you look at the, your carton drafts, your VBs and stuff, like the level of engineering and mechanics and and like the different variables that they're juggling to achieve that consistency with agricultural products is huge, like really huge. And and it's the same like if you go. Um, if you look at a distillery, like say Jim Beam, for example, like they've got hundreds and hundreds of barrels um, that they're pouring the whiskey into. And they've got people whose job is to sample from each of those barrels and figure out which character from each of the barrels, how much of them they need to blend together to get the Jim Beam yeah, flavor. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, because and each one, all of those barrels will be huge, different. Each one of those barrels is going to be completely different and each time they use it is going to have yield completely different results. So. It's like somebody's job to go through and blend from all those different variables into a consistent product. So it, it's, we, we have this expectation in beer that we're going to get the same results because we've kind of grown up drinking these like super engineered, super like intensely produced um, products. 
but it's so much harder to achieve that level of consistency on a, small, on a smaller scale. Yeah. And the smaller scale you go to, the harder it is to yeah. achieve that. To the point where when, when you hit a, a homebrew yes. level, yeah. well, yeah. like yep. using, to... using Amarillo in your beer is probably going to have less of an impact on the flavor as like going four minutes over your boil. Yes. You know, like, like there, there's yeah. so, all these like little things that come into play. Like you, you're never going to get the exact, exact beer that the person who wrote the recipe yep. is, is kind of giving you. Yep. And I think it, it's kind of helpful as a home brewer to be able to embrace that and, and yep. really run with it. And um, there is not that kind of level of expectation in wine. Like Yes, I know. That's, that's um, uh, yeah, interesting. You but... expect every bottle of wine to be different Slightly but you definitely different. expect every year like yeah, every vintage that's from why the they same put the winery. vintage on the wine you know the, the the year on the wine bottle is a signifier that it's a little a little um uh yeah that uh the, you know this bottle is going to be a certain have a certain flavor uh, and then the next year might be different. and sommeliers yeah. will we'll talk about like the season like They'll talk about, oh, you know, like in, in Chile in 2018, like they had like a really extended frost season. So that's impacted the way that the grapes are expressing themselves. And, the, and like, you know, the really hardcore sommeliers will be able to tell you the year of the wine, and like just not just tasting. the region and the grape, but the year, be, like based on some of that info. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really impressive and, and amazing. But it's like it, wine has really managed to embrace that variance mm. with ingredients and, and understand that like you're talking about things that grow in the ground and they're going to grow differently in different conditions and no two years are the same yep. like and there's so, no reason beer can't be like that as well yeah especially hops the the, the, the impact that um yeah which is a really really long-winded wanky rant about um why it's not that important yeah <laughs> if, if you can't Thanks get the exact hops there, you want um <laughs> for your NEPA. but it's in, it's a, i think it's a good um, something, something to for, for new brewers to um, think about, because yeah, it's not yeah, something absolutely. that necessarily is obvious. Well, and, um, and there's something you know, like when I first got started, like I brewed one of the earlier all grain beers that I brewed was an ESB, um, and it was delicious. And I'm like, oh, I want to brew that again. So then I brewed the same recipe, and it was a completely different beer, yeah. and I couldn't figure out why. Um, it was all those other variables that were at play, and, and that can you know, like that can help you sort of start to develop the technical aspects as well. So like I was just talking about how you're never going to achieve crazy levels of consistency, but you can achieve a degree a level. of consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like looking at, so like temperature control was a big one, um, factoring in like the, um, the differences in the hops I used the first time to the hops I used the second time, even though they were the same type of hop. Yeah. Like how did they differ? Um, like all those, all those about little your things. ingredients and yeah, and like knowing kind of how much viable yeast I was likely to be starting with and then building a starter to get the same pitch rate across and like dialing in the temperatures, like all those little things like make a big difference and, and, and you can control that. Yep. Um, so yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's good fun. Yeah. And every time I brew this beer, I pretty much use different hops. Yeah, right. Yep. Because I base it on, I'm lucky, I work at a homebrew shop. So I get to stick my head into every bag of hops that we open, um, have a really good sniff and s figure out if I like them or yeah, not. If they're as good as the last batch. Yeah. Um, so if, if we get some really, really good hops in and I, I have a good whiff of them, I'm like, I'm using these in the beer and, and I'll supplant them into like a recipe that I've already got or I'll make a recipe around that hop or, or, or things like that. So um, I'll make decisions based on how good the hops are mm, smelling. Yeah. Um, I'll make decisions based on if we just get the 2020 batch of Kiwi or Australian hops in, which we did a while ago now, but uh, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna use these new 2020 hops. That's really exciting, and they're they're fresh, and I know they're good. And, and yeah, I think I think there's something in there uh, to be said too about not being overly uh, fixated on recipe. Um, you know, I guess both Ben and I, we, I see a lot of customers who come in and they've found a recipe. Um, that they really like the look of, but it's from the States and we don't have the same um, ingredients, access to the same ingredients here that they do over there. So you have to make substitutions and um, there can be a, uh, a perception maybe that the beer won't be as good. Um, could be better. It could be better, exactly. So don't be afraid to, yeah, don't be too dogmatic about recipe. Be, don't be afraid to just switch things up and um, 
try different hops that aren't necessarily on the recipe that you find. Um, play around and yeah, experiment is, is yeah. part of the fun of it all really. So all that being said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to completely contradict yeah. everything. Well, I mean, you know, life and existence is all in contradictions, right? There's opposing forces in everything. Um, but we do have a bunch of different types of hops, which tend to have higher levels of the types of oils that we're wanting to um, introduce into our beer. Uh -huh. So, so there's it, yep, I'm with you. So, so there are, there are specific um, hop oils which you want to have an abundance of in a Nipah. Um, the big ones and like really like the, the big two, like the other ones, like you can get really deep into it and I don't have a screen in front of me to read them. <laughs> so I don't want to like um, get it all wrong and stuff. I'll, I'll just stick with the two that are really kind of crucial and that is geraniol and uh, linalool or linalool. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. Um, yeah, L-I-N-A-L-O-L. <laughs> Um, they're, they're kind of your two specific hop oils that are kind of crucial for the, the characteristic juicy sort of fruitiness of the style. Um, and you can, like you can literally Google um, what hops are good for Nipahs. <laughs> <laughs> like what hops have the good oils? What are the oils that are good for Nipahs? And it'll come up with like what the oils are and then you can jump onto Yakima Chief's website or you can jump onto um, various different kind of hop categorizing websites and look at the kind of oil, like a lot of them will have like breakdowns of the different oils and the percentages of them in the overall um, <coughs> makeup of the, of the hops. Um, and you can kind of make decisions from that. Um, one thing that I found is like really interesting um, is there are people who are kind of experimenting with other things that aren't hops that have the same oils in them. Oh, okay. So I know coriander seeds, um, specifically the Indian coriander seeds are really good for this. Um, they're like the kind of the more oval shaped ones rather than the little spherical ones. Yes. Um, so this always confused me because there are Two there are different, types, different, types, different types, types, not necessarily. So the true. Indian ones, the oval shaped ones, have a real citrusy twang to them. Like you open a bag and there's like a pungent lemony sort of character, um, which is oh, so good. Um, and using those in, well, using those generally in beers, like they're used in wit beers a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and gozers and those kinds of things. Um, it just gives a really delightful sort of floral, zesty, spicy kind of character. Yep, citrus, like you say, orange, yep. But one of the oils that produces that is, um, I think it's, it might be the linalool. Uh -huh. It's one of those two main sort of oils. Um, so people have been experimenting with throwing these coriander seeds into their nephas oh. and, and seeing if they can get more of those kind of flavours and characters in there. Um, I haven't looked too much into the results. Um, I think it'll definitely be an interesting, interesting. experiment. I'll yeah. definitely do it one okay. day. I see I that working just on a flavour uh, yeah. side too. Yeah, it's a really cool thing. Um, um, and yeah. and um, so you probably know, you go to the bottle shop and you look at all the hazy beers, you look at all the big hoppy beers and you just see beer after beer after beers like Mosaic, Simcoe, Citra, <laughs> Galaxy. Like it's, it's those same sort of four or five hops that uh -huh. are in every single beer. Um, and the reasoning behind that is because those are the hops that have those characteristics. They're high those they've got those oils. oils, they've got those, those sorts of um, things going on in them that are going to contribute the, um, the right effects to the beer. Um, there are more than that though. They're just the ones that are really mass produced because so many breweries were already using them. They're easy to get your hands on, they're easy to throw at, at your beers. They're probably getting less easy now because everyone's using them even more than they were, but that whole supply and demand thing is the more people use them, the more paddock spaces get taken over by those hops and then the more the other hops disappear yeah, off yeah. the market. Pushed aside. Um, There's a new hop called Strata, which yes. I had some uh, recently used and 
found to be quite good. I have no idea if it's uh, in that yeah, that's kind right. of wheel, wheelhouse. But, it's a uh, very yeah. dank one, isn't it? Strata? It's supposed to be, but I found it it's more um, grapefruit. Sort of, okay. Uh, like classic old school kind of West Coast IPA. Nice. Kind of nice. Yeah, it was nice. So anyway, that's just a, a little uh, a, something new for people to try, uh, perhaps if they're getting uh, tired of the old Mosaic, Simcoe, Amarillo kind of yeah. combo. Um, yeah, basically. Um, so in my Nipa, I do fall into some of the cliches. Oh, sorry, was there a question? No, no, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Good, I was just, yep. I do fall into some of the cliches. Um, I do use Simcoe. Um, so the reason why I use Simcoe, I use Simcoe for bittering. Um, and there's, there's kind of a couple of different schools of thought in regards to how to bitter these beers. Some people say you should aim to get all of your IBUs from a flame out addition, um, which I tried on my first attempt and it was really nice, but I felt like it was missing something. Like you get something from an hour boil, I think, of, of hops that is... Got it. Interesting. I don't even know it's if it's hard. the bitterness itself or mm -hmm. if it's like the boiling of the hop matter, but it, it contributes something, something like it's like a complexity, intangible. it's like an extra flavour. Yeah, an intangible sort of thing. Um, and I was missing that. So I do put in about half of my bitterness level, my estimated bitterness level, goes in in the form of a, of a small Simcoe edition yep. at the start of the boil. And I'd say a 20 gram Simcoe edition at the start of the boil. Yep, okay. And that is regardless of the alpha acid of the Simcoe. Okay. So this is a kind of standard thing that you do when cubing is this just for the uh, no, this Venetians? is just personally for this it's type of beer the top of beer so half work out your overall bitterness i'm just roughly, uh, just, for, just, for, just for people who are curious out there um roughly yeah sure yep and so half of that goes in the boil as a bittering addition and then your obviously your flavor and aroma hops are going to be set Regardless, yeah, and that all comes um, that all comes from the cube into the cube. So, so half of half of my overall bitterness, roughly, is going to come from what goes into the cube. Yeah. And Simcoe is a great hop because for bittering, um, it is a very soft bitterness. It's known as yeah, it gives you a very soft. Uh, and again, that's the oils, the types of oils that are in there. Um, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Simcoe, Simcoe, it's a great bittering hop. It's very low cohumulone. Um, which is generally sort of seen, and I know this is another one of those tropes which may have been disproven, I don't yeah. care. <laughs> anecdotal, anyway. Anecdotally, every time I use this hop for bittering, I get exactly the type of bitterness that I'm chasing yeah. from that hop, which is, it's there, it's assertive, but it's not harsh. It's not biting, it's mm. not sharp. It's, if, if, I, if I make a, if I was to throw a galaxy, into the kettle for 60 minutes, the bitterness that I would get from that would be like that stuff you used to paint on your nails to stop you from biting them. Uh huh. It's that biting, bracing, Real. sharp, harsh bitterness. Yep. Um, as as a, a, an example of it, the complete opposite, Chinook is known as a hop that has that sort of uh, overly sharp bitterness. Again, I don't know, that's a bit Yeah, that's and mean, Galaxy, true, Big but, Secret. Mm -hmm. um, there are a bunch. There are a bunch. That, and, and then there's like, it's a spectrum as well. Like there's some hops like Cascade, which you can definitely use for bitterness, but it does have a bit of that sharpness, but it's got a bit of a kind of, it's nowhere near in the same um, kind of field as like a Galaxy or something like that. And sometimes you want a bit of that sharpness. So having yeah, some Galaxy in as, as your bittering hop in, in a beer that you're chasing that can be a really good thing. Um, but like I said at the start, we're trying to achieve bitterness without the harshness. Mm -hmm. and Smooth. If yeah, if you and, and by using Simcoe, the, it's just another level of how we can achieve that. So we do have a question, uh, Isaac, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it earlier, but what IBUs are you aiming for in general in, with your Nipahs or this recipe? I'm glad you asked because we're about to go into <laughs> IBUs. Um, so I don't care about IBUs sure. in this beer. Okay, here we go. Um, th this beer for me is about grams per litre. Um, if we're doing all the things to soften the edge of the bitterness, we can go pretty high with the IBUs and not really struggle with it. Like it's not going to be like too much of a harsh beer to drink. 
Mm -hmm. um, my main concern is having the right flavour and having the right kind of character to the beer. And I think using grams per litre is the way that I've managed to consistently get that. Um, and that was something that I learned. Um, so Brendan O'Sullivan um, is a very big friend of the, of the shop. Um, he's sort of been around the scenes for a long time. He's head brewer out, out at Three Ravens. And this was something that he um, told me about. Um, or sort of first introduced the idea of to me um, at, at one of the sort of Good Beer Week events we were kind of hanging out at. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's like focusing more on the grams per litre than the IBUs um, as a way to chase that. And I mean, you guys all know the Three Ravens Juicy range. They're one of the more successful um, and more delicious um, NIFA, commercially yeah, available NIFAs on, on the market. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I take what he has to say pretty seriously on, on that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and like it, it really has, I think, um, liberated me a little bit, <laughs> a little bit yeah. um, in, in the way that I approach this. So I still use IBUs in other types of beers. So mm -hmm. um, it's just the hoppy beers, like your IPAs and stuff, where it's an IPA. Who cares? If I'm at 150 IBUs, I'm at 150 IBUs. It's an IPA. Yeah, and it's also a difficult thing. Um, the What the recipe predicts, those IBU formulas uh, there's been a lot of anecdotal, I think, oh, yeah. research that it's really hard to numbers. predict. There's what, yeah, widely different results. So you use them as a guide, but not something to fixate on, perhaps. I'm chasing hop oils and mm -hmm. I'm chasing hop flavours in this beer, um, and the bitterness is kind of secondary to that. Um, and the fact that we've got that high fat content, we've got the high chloride to sulfate ratio, where um, we're using a hop as our main bittering hop, which is notoriously soft in the bitterness. Like we're doing all these things to kind of soften the blow of the bitterness anyway. Yeah. Um, but we still want it to be an IPA. And that's, that's, I think, where a lot of people can go wrong in this style, is, is that they try too hard to limit the bitterness level yeah. instead of limiting the impact of the bitterness. Yeah, so the, all the things like the, I mean, probably the, a big one is the chloride to sulfate ratio. Like a lot of, a lot of chloride in there is going to give that pillowy mouth, uh, contribute to that pillowy mouth feel as, as well as all the oats and the, the, the wheat and the, the flour yeah. even. Um, Isaac uh, just posted a question asking about that point, basically, um, if you aren't worried about IBUs, do you think that, that can, you know, if you make it overly bitter, will that impact the that soft mouth feel that Nipahs are known for? Nah, it should do. Yeah, I think I'd be more worried about going under for bitterness because it, it's it's quite a sweet beer, like because you, you get so much fruitiness from the hops and from the yeast and from all that that. Um, you want to balance it. Um, and whilst you don't have that sharpness, you still want to balance, you want to have the bitterness there to balance the flavours. You want the flavour profile to be in check. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're going to go too far with that. Yeah. Because you, you, like, we can only perceive up to like, I think it's like 110 100. IBUs or something like that. Yep. Is like the, the flavour threshold for like, for people. Yep. Um, I'm sure some people who <laughs> smash down like stone and... Yeah, Russian maybe like all that. those things might have pushed their threshold a bit past that, but um, you're not. It's, it's going to be pretty hard to go too far with the bitterness um, yeah. in this type of beer, yeah. um, given especially that the bulk of the hops are very much going in at the end, yeah. and you're only going to get so much bitterness out of them anyway. So there's no need to go overboard with the bitterness yeah. at the beginning of the boil. I think 20 grams of Simcoe at the start of the boil gives that thing that I was missing in my initial attempt, which didn't have any um, kettle hops. Um, it, it just gives it that, oh, yeah, that intangible kind of mm. something that it was missing. Um, and that's about the right amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, I don't know what that is equates to an IBUs. It, it varies each brew because the alpha is gonna change depending on which Simcoe I'm using. Um, but I don't find that it makes too big a difference in the end beer because it, yep. I'm getting the oils, I'm getting the, the hot matter, I'm getting all those things that I'm chasing. So. Focus. Yeah, I made a, I guess an XPA, it, does, it wasn't really to style, I just made it. Um, uh, basically all my hops went in at the end and it was a hop stand beer with a cave yeast. And um, yeah, it's fine, but the, the bitterness just isn't there. It's, um, uh, 
which is just just an interesting, you know, um, uh, I guess observation. Um, people um, again going back to that point four about experimenting with yeah different things. Try try make a deeper with all the hops in, the, in at the end, just or cube hopping only, see what it tastes like. Make the same recipe again, um, but this time, as Ben's saying, maybe try putting some hops in at the boil. It might uh, be that you prefer it. Yeah, yeah, um, go with what you prefer at the end of the day. You're going to end up with 20 litres of whatever it is it's that you're be making, so it's, it's, it's got way. to be what you want to yeah. drink, um, yeah. not what not what some guy on YouTube told you Tells is, you. is the right, <laughs> right way to do things, right? So, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of giving, again, anecdotal, <laughs> anecdotal experience kind of tempered with a little bit of reading and research, um, but... And yeah, asking questions to people that know more than me, like mm -hmm, you know, definitely. chatting to people like Brendan and yeah. and like the amazing people that we kind of have access to in this awesome beer scene when we're not kind of closed down and shut up in our houses. But um, yeah, yeah. It, like it really is an awesome scene, and and the people in it are always um, when they're out and about, generally really open and really friendly and, and willing to kind of have a chat to you about um, about things like that. You know, they're passionate, they're excited about yep. this stuff, and and to have a chance to kind of talk about their, you know, their, their career and, and their, their sort of, their hobby, their, their passion. Um, yeah, m most people are generally pretty, pretty keen and excited to do so. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of other questions if you have time. How's mm -hmm. the temperature going there? Is it? Uh, uh, yeah, so we're, we're ramping up to the mash out now. So we're okay. um, 69 degrees. Forwards into the mash. Um, so well, yeah, well, we're through the mash. We're oh, heading, yeah, up, sure, heading up to mash out. out so. Um, Still on the hops then, we've got, um, I don't know if we covered this, uh, Shannon is asking grams per litre, uh, uh, is asking grams per litre for each edition and typically you would aim for an overall grams per litre for the whole batch. Yep, and I, I forgot to write it on my little piece oh, of no. paper, but um, I basically do about total dry hop <laughs> Yep, is about Oh, uh, what would it be? Eight grams a litre. Okay. Um, I can push past that and regularly do. Yes. Um, but I, I'll, I'll usually do about 80 grams total in the first dry hop and then another 80 grams in the second. Yep. Um, and I'll, 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 I'm putting 40 grams of citra in the cube today and I, I can and regularly do push that up to yeah. 80 as well. I have read that, I mean, there's no such thing as hard and fast rules, um, except when there are. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, when it comes to dry hopping, yeah, there's you know sort of eight to twelve is I think kind of what they say for IPAs. Um, Once you push past twelve grams a litre, it's diminishing returns. Yeah, and you get so yeah. much of that kind of grassy kind of vegetal um, from the hop from the, just the sheer quantity of hot matter in the beer. Um, so I guess eight grams a litre is on the conservative end of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also kind of handy because again, doing this grams per litre thing means that you like, you can make your recipes to like exactly match the packs of hops that you buy. <laughs> so you can get like 80 grams of citra, 80 grams of galaxy, 80 grams that's, of kahatsu. That's how I work my recipes. I know that. Uh, yeah, 40 that's... grams of Simcoe or whatever. And then you like, you've, you've got all of your hop additions sorted. Yep. Yep. That's um, cool. You don't have to buy unnecessary hops. And if, if, like, honestly, if people out there are making hoppy beers or even just in general, um, if you ever see Aldi will occasionally have a sale on vacuum sealers. Mm hmm. And the Aldi vacuum sealers are better than the way more expensive ones you get from like Kmart and Target and those sorts of places. Um, I know this for a fact because we got an Aldi vacuum sealer on special and then my partner fell in love with it and decided to go to Target to buy a fancy vacuum sealer from like for us, for their school that they teach at. And um, we very quickly found out that it was of a much lower quality than the cheap Aldi ones. So. If you see Aldi go on sale for vacuum sealers, snatch them up. It was having, yeah. he's like Finn's That's walking past right now and just like nodding his head and going, <laughs> yes, do it. it. Quinn says yes, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, they recently had one actually and I, I ran down to grab one and they were gone. Oh, so yeah, if you can see them come up, get them, get them quick. But they, having a good vacuum sealer, um, if you do, 
make a beer where you're not using the entirety of your pack of hops, being able to just seal them up and chuck them in the freezer means that those hops are going to be good for the next beer you do. If you've got them kind of loose and unsealed, um, you're only going to have a very limited window in which to use them before they start to go cheesy and lose their kind of um, their spark. So yeah, vacuum, vacuum sealer is a um, very, very useful tool to have as a home brewer for um, preserving your hops. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of basically, <laughs> basically the, the, um, the thinking behind my hops. Like it, I'm trying to get an amount of hop oil into the beer and hop flavour into the beer and I'm not too concerned with, with what Beer Smith tells me the IBUs are going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go, uh, uh, I don't know if you probably want a, a number, but... When 20 grams the in the kettle, 40 grams in the cube, yeah. and 80 grams at each dry hop is pretty much what I do. Um, those later hops, there's always going to be Simcoe in there because I'm only using 20 grams, so I put the other 20 grams into one of the dry hops just because I've got it. Yep. It's a delicious hop. Simcoe, seriously, there's a reason why so many brewers use it because it's a great flavour and aroma hop and it's a great bittering hop. It's a really good all-rounder. Um, you get a really nice black currant sort of character from it, I find. Um, and like a sort of piney kind of character as well. Yes. It's, yes, it's, it's a really nice hop. So the, uh, oh. Sorry, my microphone was off. So the, if you're plugging this into a, a, uh, a recipe software, the IBUs it could give you might vary wide, anywhere from 60 to 120 or more, it could probably yeah. over 100, it'll, it'll give you um, a predicted IBU measurement, but that's probably not going to be re what it comes out to. So go definitely go uh, grams per litre yeah. is, is the key. Um, you do want to, like, I've, I've said that and I've been harping on about don't worry about IBU, but you do want to have like you have some a level, yeah. 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 You, well, you want to be 60, over 50. Yeah, over 50, yeah. sure. As, as long, like, yeah, That's and nice. yeah, 60, 70 is probably better. 80, still fine. Just follow, like, a stand. Well, mm, I don't want to, actually, I'm going to stop because I'll, I'll give some, some wrong advice. Yeah, <laughs> and, and an honestly, IPA, it, it's an IPA. So, like, say so. Simcoe came out one year and it was, like, 9% alpha acid or something and your 20 grams wasn't going to cut it, then maybe knock it up to 25, 30 grams yeah. Yeah. just to get your bitterness. So you do have bitterness there sort of thing, but really don't stress, like don't kind of stay up at night thinking about it is, is the main takeaway. Yep. So in terms of the actual hops to use, um, we've obviously touched on Simcoe, Galaxy, Citra, Mosaic. Yep. Um, yep. Some of the ones that I really like, I love Kiwi hops in these beers. Um, I really love Kiwi hops. Rewaka is one of my all time favorite hops ever. Nice. It's just got such a unique flavour to it. Um, someone, I heard someone say like petrol once, yeah, which was right. unexpected. Um, and now I'm trying not to notice it because I don't want to ruin <laughs> That's it. That's how it works, isn't it? Someone will mention a flavour uh, uh, that you've not even thought of and then your brain makes that connection. And it's but for me, taste. Rewaka, a lot of those kiwi hops actually, it's like, you know when you go to the fruit market and you see like a random sort of Southeast Asian tropical fruit that you've never heard of before, it's weird shape, weird colour, and you take it home and you kind of take a bite and you're like, you're not sure whether you love it or hate it, um, but then you, before you realise it, you've gone through like a whole bag of them and you're just like, oh no, I definitely love it. That's kind of like the, the sort of fruity flavours I get from a lot of kiwi hops, like they're that sort of funky, quirky, weird fruit flavours that you can't really put your finger on exactly what it is, but you just know you like it. Yeah. Um, and Rewak yeah. is a really big one for that. It's, it's got this real sort of tangy, fruity, um, sort of delicious tropical kind of character to it um, and I think it works so well in the context of these sort of fruity neepers um, because it is giving a different dimension of fruitiness it's not just that sort of citrus pine grapefruit sort of character it's, it's, it's giving you a different layer and a different kind of um, jumping off point so I, I do like to try to get Rewaka in there in the dry hop yeah. Um, Kahatu is another one that I use a lot of. I do like those, yeah, New Zealand hops, yeah. Kahatu is, is um, pretty much a standard in my neepers. Um, 
And it's quite a subtle hop, um, Kahati, but I, th I feel like it tempers um, some of the more bold hops um, that you can kind of play with. Um, El Dorado is really nice. Mm -hmm. It's got like pineapple-y kind of character to it, um, which is really, really good. Um, yeah. What are some other ones that I've used? So many, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep on talking about the Kiwi ones because they're so good, but I really yeah. want to do one with Waiiti, which we've only recently sort of got in. Um, but that's got some really... I've not brewed with it yet, but it's got some really nice smells to it. So I want to kind of see what it's like in a beer. Yeah. So are there, are there any good resources people can use? We did have a question early uh, from um, someone... Oh, sorry, I can't remember your name, but uh, they were just asking about, yeah, what? where can you find out about hops, uh, either bittering hops, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, or flavour and aroma hops that are good for particular beers? So we, I think in our descriptions on our website, have tried to put down if it's a bittering or rounder or a late hop. I don't know for sure. I'll have to double check that because things are changing a lot lately. Like we've sort of like been redesigning we websites and, and doing lots of things. So that, that might have changed. But um, for a while we were writing that. Um, in our description on our Citra Hops right here, we've got... But uh, you do, doesn't say. do find in the hop descriptions, if you go to the hop growers websites, yeah. the or well, the suppliers, there's a few of them out there, a bit of a five minutes on Google will will point you in the direction. They will list the properties of the hops and what they are good for. Some hops are known as dual purpose. They're good for bittering and aroma. Some are better for just bittering. It's just uh, something you kind of just have to just do a bit of, sit down with a beer one day and do a bit of a, a read. Go through our website, yeah. the hop section. And um, I've, I just looked at the citra and it doesn't, doesn't say whether say. it's a bittering or an aroma hop. So um, it, it might be hit or miss depending on the hop um, yep. with what description we put on there. Um, but definitely, yeah, like, like Joel was saying, um, go to the growers, go to Yakima yeah. Chief. Yakima Chief. Um, go to uh, Hop Coal Australia. Yeah. Um, go to, to, to blank. is it Hop Coal? No, maybe it's not. I'm trying to think of who we get our Galaxy and stuff from. But yeah, go to the growers mm. um, and they'll, they'll have like a really good breakdown of, of, of kind of what types of things are in the hops and, and how to use them. Yep, yeah. and if you find um, a hop that you so, like the look of, mm. um, try it. Yeah. That's the other, that's the, probably the only, you know, just the only real way is to, is to try it in your beers. And, um, and let us know, place. like if you, if, yeah. you've, if you've found a hop that, um, that you really like the look of and no one's stocking, um, tell all your friends about it and then tell us. And then if all your friends are also telling us and we're getting heaps of people saying, hey, you guys should try to get this hop in, then we will check with our hop suppliers if we can get it. Like if, if there's enough of a demand for something, then we might get five kilos of it in and see how it sells. Um, so Yeah, for sure. I think it was Caltaz who asked that question. And, and I think there's been a few other posts about people mentioning their hops. Uh, El Dorado, Shannon is, said, um, and then yeah, Isaac's uh, also big upping uh, kiwi hops. So yeah, if anyone else has any suggestions mm. out there for either bittering hops that like Simco uh, offer that soft kind of bitterness or um, just any flavour aroma hops that are good in Nipahs. With our Lefty Juicy Work Kit, we tend to, based on availability, cycle between Galaxy, Citra and El Dorado. Mm -hmm. um, we have put other ones in there, um, but they're sort of the main three that, that we kind of use for, for that yep. for that beer. Um, so you generally get like an 80 gram of Citra, 80 gram of Galaxy, or an 80 gram of El Dorado, 80 gram of Citra. Um, for and the again, hops. there's, there's um, that variability we were talking about. Even, yeah. even, our, even our kits have to vary from time to time, depending on... When, when we're doing sort of close to a thousand litres of it, um, we need to have a decent quantity of, of whatever hops it is. So if we're down to our last five kilo bag of Citra, and that's a hop that everybody's always buying, um, we're less likely to put three kilos into a, <laughs> into a work kit. We'll, we'll um, pick one of the other hops um, that maybe we've got a little bit more stock of. Um, and they always come out good, so. Yeah. There's, there's, there's not really a, um, a loss in the compromise sort of thing. Like we always make sure whatever we're, whatever we're swapping with is, is not so much a compromise as it is a um, an equal sort of yeah, uh, uh, a, a, a step sideways or yeah. a, what do you call it? Yeah, but uh, yeah, we don't just chuck any old thing, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah we want it to taste good. Yeah, and, and we are thinking about as well, like the, again, linalool, geraniol. They're the two. They're the two oils you're looking for, um, and they're also the two oils which linalool in particular um, will outlast 
like will last longer in the boil and last longer into the um, into the finished beers. Um, I say that, but uh, as we move into the boil, which will be soon, which is why I'm kind of I'm hesitating to go into this topic of conversation yet until we've lifted the grains out, because I know if I start on it, then it will start beeping at me to pull the grains out and I'll have to do it. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm kind of trying to drag this section out a little bit longer. Um, eight minutes longer, in fact, um, so, that, so that we can kind of get into biotransformation, um, which, is, which is one of the really cool, funky, fun, weird things that happens um, with Nikas. Cool. So I reckon uh, it might be time to have a maybe a, quick a little break. break yeah. 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 I uh, I have to tend to a couple of camera things, but uh, yeah, we'll take a little break, um, and we won't be long. We'll be right back.
We are back. Cool. Um, yeah, so I just sort of um, used that opportunity to do a few things. So um, I had um, the hose that I'll be using to run the wort from the kettle into the cube. Um, had that soaking in some OxyClean this morning. Um, pulled that out, gave it a really good rinse. Um, I always say with that sort of stuff, um, rinse it until it doesn't smell like cleaner anymore. <laughs> um, so it just smells like hose and water. Um, and then you know you're pretty much good to go. And then I've just um, popped that in a jug with some sanitizer. Um, so that'll be triple sanitized by the time it gets boiling hot wort run through it. Um, and then at some point as well, I'm gonna pour that sanitizer into the cube, give it a bit of a shake and then pour it back. And that'll just sort of, it, it's almost an unnecessary step, um, but it's never an unnecessary step when you're talking about hygiene in brewing. <laughs> is, is I guess a good way to think about it. You, you kind of, um, anytime things go wrong, you can almost always trace it back to that like point where you're like, oh, I'll probably get away with that. And then you don't get away with it. Um, so healthy paranoia goes a long way. Um, and that a little bit of pointless fluff talking sounds, has gotten sounds us like to, <laughs> to the point that we should remove the mop pipe. Oh, that is looking clear. Again, it's really annoying that um, that steam is a thing <laughs> because um, otherwise we put the camera on there, you'd see how crystal clear this word is, but um, it, it will fog up the lens. Um, but it's, it's worked perfectly. Um, all that flour, which was creating a very hazy, milky, starchy mess in there is, I reckon, been sufficiently converted. Um, and we've got a crystal clear wort sitting in there. Um, so I'm going to pull the malt pipe out. And while I do that... Well, are you gonna need a hand with this? Would you like uh, me to step Yes, in? I will actually. <laughs> I'll enlist the manual assistance of one Joel to come over and, and uh, help. And I should realistically be using gloves for this as well, because it does heat up a little bit. It's been sitting at 80 degrees, but yeah. <laughs> so what I'm basically gonna do, well, first thing I'm gonna do is tick the start boiling button so that um, it's still heating while we're doing all this. Yep, saves a bit of time. Yep. Start cranking the boil um, while you would do all the sparging and lifting and such. Yes. So I've got a ladder. It looks rickety, but it's actually quite stable. Um, otherwise I wouldn't be getting on it. <laughs> Um, and what I'm basically going to do... You're a braver man than me. No, safety first. Yeah. What I'm basically going to do, I'm just cl going to climb up. Whoa, pump is running. Um, that's not so good. Is, do you want me uh, to yeah, switch it off. It? Pause it. Phew. That was a mistake. All right, don't tick the button. <laughs> um, I'm going to grab the hooky thing. That's the technical... I thought I had it around. Oh, it's under. Uh, you got, yep. Ah, uh, so if the Shannon from before was Shannon Bennett, he's probably pissing himself laughing right now because he's got a brow master and he, he would have seen me unscrew the crossbar and then switch the pump back on. Yeah, right. And, just, and wait for the filter imagine to Imagine all the, the grain spilling out the top of the malt. But we managed to stop it. We, yeah, we grabbed, the, grabbed the filter before it had a chance to lift off. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to lift this up and then Joel is going to slide the trivet underneath and then I'll put it back down. So, it's a two-handed job. Excellent. Got it. Perfect. Cool. Uh, we have mentioned this in past streams as well, but a ratchet and pulley comes in very handy. If you're doing this on your yeah. own, um, attaching it to a sturdy beam and... And when we do the, um, when we do the in-person demos, um, we've actually got a, a crane attached to one of the 500 litre Browmasters, which we hook a ratchet up to and lift it that way. Um, yep. Also, if you're doing this at home, probably use a lower table as well, so you don't have to get up a ladder to do it. Yep. But like I said, this is a 
nice sturdy ladder. Um, and having a friend to slide a trivet under means you can actually use two hands to lift it up and you're not gonna do your back or wrist or something like that. Some other, um, yeah, muscle. Um, and it is hot too, as Ben said. So yeah, it's about 80 degrees. Yep. So what we're gonna do now, looking in there, I can see we're sitting at about 20 degrees, uh, 20 liters rather. Um, so I'm going to walk off camera and leave you with a shot of the brown muscle and then walk back. Um, no, I'm going to put about five liters of water in there. It is still dripping through. So when I say about, I do mean about. Um, this is just cold water, which again is why I will switch that back on so it keeps heating. Uh, this is cold water, so it will knock a bit of the heat out of the kettle. So it'll take a little bit longer to pick back up again, uh, but that's okay. Basically, what I'm trying to do is get to a 25 litre pre-boil volume. Now, if you watched the Munich Hallis demo last week, I talked a bit about um, doing your, your volume calculations. Um, when you're brewing. And that is something that is important to do so that you can get a consistent gravity on your beers and, and get consistency that way. Again, for the purposes of this demo, it's not as important. Um, and potentially if you're just, um, sorry, just walking through the, through the shot. I'll probably have to go back and put a bit more water in. Oh yeah, Joel got, Joel got a bit sticky um, with the trivet. Um, for the purposes of, if you're just making beer that's gonna taste good, don't have to worry as much about it. Um, but it's good practice to get into um, because if you do wanna get consistent, the more practice you have at doing those calculations, the better. Um, but I will deliberately put more grain into my recipes than I need so that I can get my minimum pre-boil volume that I want to get enough work at the end of the process com whilst comfortably hitting my targets in terms of sugar. Um, and then I'll dilute from there. So sort of um, if I need to make it say 20, 28 litres at the start of the boil based on the amount of sugar of its structure over the course of the mash, then I'll just add that extra water in and, and achieve it that way. Um, it's much easier to add water than it is to add sugar once you, once you through your mash. Um, so I'm confident that if I hit 25 litres on this, I'm not going to go, it won't be too diluted. I'll still get the, the concentration that I need. And it'll also mean that all the hop amounts that I've kind of calculated for are going to be matching with the, the total amount of litres that I'm making. Um, and I'm not going to sort of go too hard. Well, we did that last week. We don't need to necessarily do it again. But it, it's, it's basically the, um, the formula is your current volume uh, multiplied by your current gravity uh, divided by your target gravity um, will give you your target volume. And it doesn't matter what, um, does not matter what units you use as long as you're consistent with them. Uh -huh. So you could use specific gravity. Um, so say like 1040 might be your target gravity. So if you say 40, um, as long as your current gravity is in the same specific gravity measurements, you're fine. If you choose to use Bome instead, if you choose to use um, bricks, as long as you're using the same units, the formula doesn't change. Don't that. I am going to need to add a little bit more water. Thanks, my new coin. It does, yeah. For those of you uh, who can't smell watching that, 
at home, it does smell good. And uh, part of that, I reckon, is the oats. Oats add a really yeah. nice kind of, like I said before, it adds a fruitiness um, to the... Yeah. So I'm being pretty conservative with the amount of water I'm adding each time, because I don't want to go overboard with it. But what I can also do is it's sort of slowly dripping through the grain. So if I hit my 25 litre mark, I can just move the malt pipe off um, and... That way, no more of the water's gonna drop in there. And I don't really need to stress too much about it. It's not, like I said, I'm not kind of... I don't even know if this cube's gonna be fermented at any point. <laughs> um, we're sort of making it for the purposes of demonstration, but... Um, my uh, my fermenter and my kegs are all kind of full, and um, I don't I don't have sort of a an empty keg to to sort of throw into the pipeline at this point in time. So um, I won't be taking it home and fermenting, but I don't know. I'll ask the guys around the shop. One of them might want to take home a neeper, and I might put their hand up and brew it. So I reckon we're going to be pretty close. I'll put a little bit more in, I think. Oh, it's still dripping though. I'll let it keep dripping for a while, see what happens. I reckon we'll, I reckon we'll hit it. Um, we'll hit 25, we'll hit 25. We're good. Um, so at this point, um, if you are doing your best practice, um, you'd grab out your refractometer, um, get a little sample on there, measure your current gravity, um, the current volume is 25 litres, it's filled up to the line. Um, so we've got those two known variables. Um, we can multiply those two numbers together and divide it by our target gravity and that will tell us how much we need to have in the kettle at the end of the boil. Really simple. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> we're 25. I was just like, oh, are we going to get... Yeah, we are. We're good. I'm going to put the ladder away. Yep. Don't mind me. I am just um, just answering a question in the chat there. Um, as Shannon puts his hand up to uh, pick the cube up. Sorry? Sh uh, Shannon's putting his hand up to come and grab the cube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just give us a call when you're in the car park. And we'll run it out. <laughs> Pop the boot. Contactless uh, delivery. Honestly, if, if you want to, like, it's fine by me. Uh, cool. So while that's doing, um, let's move on to the the final piece of the puzzle. And I was talking to Joel before um, when we were on the break, and I said this is going to be where the controversy comes in. Um, <laughs> right, here we go. Because this is where there are wildly different theories um, as to what works and, and why it works and how to achieve the end beer. Well, actually, mm? just before we dive into that, I notice the, the battery on the camera is uh, getting low. Okay. It's sort of just drained all of a sudden. Uh, really sorry to... We're going to have to go to a break again, but really quickly this time. It will only be a minute, so um, please hang in there. We'll be right back.
Um, yeah, sorry about that, guys. Just gotta gotta keep the camera rolling, otherwise uh, <laughs> we don't have. Uh, I'm talking to no one. There goes the stream. So thanks for everyone hanging in there. Um, but yeah, we were just getting we were just getting into the getting into the controversy, getting into the into the danger zone. Um, so <laughs> yeast. There are a number of different thoughts and opinions on what happens in the fermenter for these beers. Um, and the fact that people who hold these quite wildly varying thoughts and opinions are able to make good quality beer means that there's probably multiple ways of achieving a similar outcome, but I don't think it's the same outcome. So I think the way that I make my Nipahs is different to the way, say, I don't know, I don't know how they make it, but let's, let's say it's different to the way that Hop Nation makes their Nipah, right? Hop Nation makes bloody delicious um, hazy IPAs. I reckon I make a pretty good one as well. Um, if we're both doing different things and, and uh, like, taking different paths to that end, um, then who cares? I don't know if we are. We might be doing exactly the same thing. I don't know. But um, I would say as well, um, and this is from sort of my own personal experimentation, that doing things one way does get a different end product than doing things the other way. And that's not to necessarily apply a quality, like a value judgment on either of them, but you are getting a different type of beer, I think. Interesting. So this is all very cryptic and very sort of um, non-tangible. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I guess but like we were what, saying, sorry, you go. Oh, sorry, yeah, so um, the two schools of, the two primary schools of thought on this are, a bunch of people say you want to use a really flocculent yeast mm. and you don't want any of the yeast ending up in the end beer. And then there's a bunch of people who say you want to use a really non-flocculent yeast that you want to stick around and stay in suspension. I have heard both, yes. So these are the two big kind of schools of thought around Nipahs. Um, and I've had beers made using both of those methods that were delicious. Mm -hmm. I've had beers from one of those methods that definitely wasn't. Ah. Um, but, yeah, it's... Um, and it comes down to yep. what, like, where the haze is coming from or what you, like, how you're, how you're trying to achieve the haze, which, to me, the haze is secondary to the flavour. Uh-huh. So if I made a beer that smelled and tasted like my Nipah, that was crystal clear, I'll still be stoked for that beer yeah. and I'd, I'd smash it down, yeah. I'd drink it happily. The fact is that that doesn't happen. It does end up being yeah, hazy. Yeah, and anyway. I think the reason why it's hazy is because it's got that protein from the grains. You've got those oils that are staying in suspension. You've got that interaction between the proteins and the polyphenols. You've got all these different things sort of happening, which are producing that haze. Um, and it's my understanding that, so the, the brewer at um, oh, the Vermont brewery, which one is it? Uh, Hedy Topper. Yeah, so Hetty Topper's the beer, I think it's the Alchemist. Ah, uh, the Alchemist, yes. Yeah, Alchemist. yeah, yeah Hedy, Hedy, yep, got it. Um, when they were developing these beers initially, they were chasing the flavour and the aroma and they were trying all these different ways to achieve that without getting the haze because they saw the haze as a fault. Mm -hmm. And eventually they kind of came to the realisation that we can't make this beer no, taste and smell it. this way and have it clear. Uh -huh. So. Yeah. They sort of embraced it, and and I think it, on the early, in the early days, I don't know if it still does, but on the heady topper cans, it, it literally says "drink from the can" because they didn't want people pouring it into the glass oh, and right. being horrified by the murky, <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the pond water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's like, I feel like a lot of people now actively chase the haze 
to the detriment of the beer. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it used to so be, obviously, for people who were around in the days when haze was considered a fault in, in beer in general. Well, to, for a few uh, examples, but IPAs especially. And then, yeah, uh, the alchemists came along and more or less invented yeah, the style. Yeah, it head. Flipped everything on its head. Um, so, yeah, I, I've seen and read on forums and like around the traps of people like doing things with their beers in an attempt to make a hazy beer that I'm looking at it and thinking this is not going to be a tasty beer mm -hmm. at all because like and and like for me it, you should never set out with the in the pursuit of making a hazy beer like you should set out in the pursuit of making it like a extremely beer. hoppy juicy um, soft beer and if you do it right the haze will just kind of happen mm -hmm. um, but the different yeast strains that tends to be the go-to's for this style are wildly different but all still seem to have the same effect interesting so um, before I go into what those are I think we should probably talk about biotransformation at least briefly, because as I've said a million times, I'm a musician, I'm not a chemist. Yep. So the really intense kind of processes that are happening there, I don't fully understand. Um, but I understand it's a thing that you want to have happen in order to get the, the right flavours and aromas in your beer. It's a buzzword at the moment. Bio, bio yeah, yeah. So basically, there's a bunch of different oils in hops which contribute to the flavour and the aroma of of like the, like the hop flavours and the hop smells that you get in your beer are like coming from a bunch of different oils and alcohols that naturally occur within the hops. Um, during active fermentation, some of those oils get taken by the yeast and turned into different compounds. So those two that we mentioned before, geraniol and linalool, get turned into limonene and beta citronellol. <laughs> so like I've, I've yeah. spent the week m memorizing those four bloody half <laughs> oil compounds. You did well. Um, you lost me at biotransformation. So that I could kind of like say them on, on, on this stream for people that are interested. But honestly, you don't need to know what they're called in order to know what they're called. Well, you kind of do in terms of if you're looking for hops that have those compounds in them so that you know like how to get those transformations. But you can Google that. You can Google like what are the hop oils that biotransform in beers or what are the hop oils that um, you're looking for in Nipah hops um, and, and Google will give you the answers. Um, but the, you still want geraniol and linalool in your beer because they give really important flavours and aromas as well. Um, and if you look at the graphs, so there've been a bunch of studies done. If you look at the graphs of like what happens during fermentation to those hop oils, it's really dramatic how quickly they drop off to practically nothing once that biotransformation occurs. So what has kind of developed is a technique whereby you do a double dry hop. So um, you'll throw an amount of hops in at the height of fermentation when it's really active and that active fermentation will take those hop oils and convert them into the into the um into those different ones that you're chasing and then once fermentations died down where you would normally do a standard dry hop anyway you throw in a second dry hop so that you're reintroducing those um your geranial and your and your um linalool into the beer so that you're getting the benefits of all of those different hop oils and characters and that's where you get that really complex really juicy fruity characterful um hop character from is from that double dry hop process now when i was reading up on it um the way it was described that you wanted to achieve this was by using a really flocculent yeast strain. When you pitch the hops, like your first dry hop at high Krausen, you've got that really active fermentation and then that yeast drops out really quickly because it's super flocculent. 
um, what that does is it gets that biotransformation happening and then drops out before it can pull the hop oils out with it. Mm -hmm. one, thing, one thing that yeast does is it has a fining effect on hop oils. So it will, it will grab onto all the different hop oils the longer it's in contact with them and pull them down to the bottom. Similar to like what a, what a fining agent would like if you put in like um, something like right Turbo or... Clear is, no. is like a good example. Like it's a two part fining agent. You like mix the part one through, it grabs onto all your yeast particles and then you sit your, your part two on top and as it drops down, it grabs all of the part one and pulls it down to the bottom. The yeast is going to grab onto those hop oils and when it does eventually flocculate out, it will pull them all out. So you've lost a really big chunk of, of, your, um, of your hop oil character in that process. So something like the Y yeast 1318, the London Hour 3, it's a super flocculent yeast strain. Um, to the point where it starts to look almost like cottage cheese in the Erlenmeyer flask when it's on the stir plate. Um, so what happens is you, you've got this really active initial fermentation stage and then it, it rockets through the fermentation, it's done in a few days and then it drops right down to the bottom and sets like a rock. So if you're waiting for that really active like peak of it when you're at high Krausen, throw your hops in there and then that biotransformation occurs because it's all happening so quickly, you get your oils converted into the, into the oils you want and then the yeast disappears before it has a chance to, to drag the hops out with it. Then you've got all that protein from your, um, from your wheat or from your unmalted um, components in, the, in, in your mash. And that kind of helps give those oils a bit, of a bit of a ride in your beer as well. So they'll, they'll kind of grab onto those proteins and stick around. Um, that is what I learned was, was the way to achieving a really good, really fruity, really sort of clean, hazy <laughs> Nipah. Yeah, yeah. The other method, or the other yeasts which are really popular, so like the London Fog. I, I don't know too much about London Fog, to be honest, but the, definitely the Vermont strain. Um, it's almost the exact opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so they're really unflocculent yeasts. They stay around with the beer, um, and the yeast itself contributes to the haze of the beer. Now, to me, that sounds like it wouldn't be overly pleasant because like, you get yeast bite and stuff, but then you drink, you drink the beers that are made with it. And it's my understanding that um, the alchemist beers, the yeast that he uses is one of these non-flocculent strains. If, if like, because the Vermont strain, which is really popular, is mm -hmm. said to come from that brewery. Yep. Um, and you also get a really delicious beer. Like you don't get that yeast bite um, from a lot of them. Um, but it kind of goes against all of the initial kind of write-ups that, that I'd read when I initially like, first did my, um, I think it was the first demo I did was a, yeah. was a um, New England IPA. And I'd, I'd been reading all these papers, all these articles, um, and brought that information into it. And it kind of seems to go against that, but it still seems to work. So what's, what's the correct answer? What's the correct way to do it? And, and I guess the answer is whichever way you like more, because they are different. I've brewed this beer with both types of yeast. I personally prefer the 1318. I prefer the, the more flocculent yeast. I, like I just find okay. it's a cleaner yep. finishing beer for me. I don't get, like I do get some yeast bite with, with the, um, the less flocculent ones. Mm -hmm. and, and like I do think that I get more of those oils kind of sticking around in the end beer. Interesting. Personally. Yep, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I but again, Preference is like subjectivity is such a huge thing. Nine tenths of the law. And when you when you're home brewing, you're like you're making beer that you want to drink. You're making beer to your specifications. So I said before, there's no right and wrong. Like this isn't me saying this is the right way to do this. I'm saying this is the way that I do, you it. do it. Yeah. And, and I've kind of based that on like reading up on it and, and like trying to learn as much as I can about it. And I think that like what I've read seems to, like it seems to me a non-scientific person to to be fairly grounded in mm -hmm. like sort of fairly sensible ideas and, and sensible kind of def like descriptions as to why things work like the way they do um, that approach yeah. is taken. But to throw a spanner in the works, I was saying earlier too that I used Kvake use for the first time recently. Mm -hmm. I've, completely missed the Kvake bandwagon. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I jumped on and, I, and for no reason other than it was uh, available and um, 
you can ferment it warm, of course. Um, I used it in a, it wasn't a NEPA, um, and it wasn't uh, an IPA, it was just a generic, cloudy, juicy XPA, I guess you could call it. And I wasn't aiming for it to be cloudy, but it came out super cloudy, and I'm assuming it was the yeast. If anyone else out there has had experience with Kvake strains, I, I think they tend to come out more cloudy. Um, I just and found that interesting. I think there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot work. going on that we still don't understand. Yes, as well. yeah. Um, and, and I think as well, like if you just put enough hops into a beer, like just the sheer volume of hop oil that's in that beer is we going to too, make it. We, yeah, I didn't throw a ton of hops in there. So that that will, yeah, exactly. So who knows exactly what's happening between the yeast and the just that amount of hops yeah. you use. And that, like, so there. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that all these different strains of yeast, not all of them are going to do bio, the biotransformation thing. So, or, or they're going to do it to differing degrees or in different ways. So the, the strains that have kind of really become the go-to strains for these types of beers are the go-to strains because they do this really well. Yep. Um, so, yeah. And, and that could also come into play as to why some people have like gone for a more flocculent strain and other people have gone for less flocculent strain because when they're looking for a, a yeast that brings out the character that they want from the hops. The best, the one that they've landed on was one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, and and um, yeah, different yeast strains have a different effect on bitterness as well. That's, that's uh, something that's been established. So, and again, in a, in a style where you want that bitterness to be soft. Um, and I think that think for me is the big reason why I like the 1318 so much because with, without having that yeast kind of bite, that yeast character, it softens the overall beer. Mm. You've got less, um, less compounds floating around. Is bitter com bitterness compounds floating around, I guess? Is that the sort of idea that Paul yeah, blows maybe. out? Yeah, Yeah, as I just find that when the, when the yeast is there, um, you get that yeast bite, yeast bite, which kind of adds to the perceived sharpness of yeah, the beer. Yeah, um, I think I must be not... I've got to still make that brain flavour connection uh, myself. But yeah, yeast bite is an interesting um, thing for people to get their heads around, yeah, to think about in beers. A good example is if you pull, so like when you're pulling a sample from the bottom of your fermenter um, and it comes out with a fair bit of yeast, if you drink that, it's got that sort of harshness to it. Yeah, I got that it. Roughness got to it. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously that's going to be a lot more um, pronounced than a little bit of yeast in suspension when you've got like a yeah. bunch of yeast. But if you, if you taste that, that's going to give you an idea of the sort of like okay. a I get that in um, example of the sort of flavour you get from yeast bite. Yeah, wild beers or lambics where I, if I drink the beer and it, the, the yeast is roused up, um, it's definitely a lot more intense and not as pleasant as a, as a beer that you've... When, when your bartender rolls candy. your Cooper's Pale across, <laughs> yeah, 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 well, across the bar before dumping all the bottle dregs into your, into your glass, you know, that could be another example. Um, guilty. Well, guilty as charged. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of character. Um, and I've seen, so like, Jamil Zanishev is a pretty well-known homebrew guru, for lack of better terms, and he can't stand these neepers. Um, and I've regularly seen him refer to yeast bite as a reason as to why um, they no, don't like nothing. them. It's like he says it's like sloppy brewing practices, like serving up this mucky <laughs> mess of a beer full of like yeast bite and mm -hmm. shrub from the bottom of the fermenter and all that kind of stuff. And I think that is actually genuinely a thing that is going that, on yeah. in some instances as well. Like, Ooh. again, like if you're working for a brewery, say, and the marketing guy, or like, you know, like whoever's the money man is, comes in and says, oh, apparently these hazy, murky IPAs are um, really popular. I need one in two weeks' time. <laughs> it's like, shit, and the brewers. Um, all right, how can I make a beer hazy? Yeah. I guess I'll dump, I don't know, this in there, or I'll, I'll let, like, I won't filter it, I'll, I'll add this, you know, like, it, it, without sort of having the time um, to, to, like, really look into that approach, they probably have been a bunch of breweries that, that have just adopted some interesting ways to get their beers to hazy there. and murky. Yeah. And if that can sort of start a like a weird feedback loop as well, because mm -hmm. then if 
if you're wanting to make that type of beer and you go out and you try a bunch of commercial examples, if a bunch of the commercial examples you've tried have not adopted those kinds of techniques which make the good, the good versions, then you get a warped perception of what those beers are supposed to be. And um, I think a lot of the criticisms I see online of this style is, is people sort of talking about um, all these people like jumping on the trends for these murky, gross, yeast bitey, sludgy, trub filled beers. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, adding, and to the, you, adding to the if controversy. If you've, if you've had style. a bunch of beers that are like that, then yeah, you'll be you'll be wondering what the hell everyone's losing their minds yeah. over. Yeah. Um, so it, it and then there's also you know there's a bit of truth to that. Like some people yeah. do jump on trends and and pretend to like things that they don't like. I mean, I'm gonna say something maybe a bit controversial, but do it. I think a lot of us initially got into beer pretending to like something that everyone else seemed to like because in general, yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of us, our first taste of beer, we probably hated. hated. <laughs> like I remember my first beer was like a warm tinny of VB that we'd snuck out of my friend's dad's like shed on New Year's Eve and like ran around like drinking, like thought we were so cool drinking mm-hmm. this warm, warm beer that we'd nicked. Um, and it was bloody horrible, but of course we had to pretend to like it because yeah. it was beer and you, you're meant to yes, like beer. You're supposed to like it. I think Carlton Cold might have been my, my first uh, beer. Um, and, and Cooper's was the first beer that I liked, funnily enough, uh, that we were just talking about before. So that, so that was, yeah, just the, the first beer that I tried that uh, was different to everything else um but yeah yeah uh, um obviously i genuinely <laughs> love beer now yeah yeah uh, obviously and, and most of us do, but, but yeah i, I think for a lot right. of people um it, it is that kind of peer pressure thing yeah. of like what you don't like beer yeah yeah and especially well bringing it back to craft beer there's the certain styles that are around now that are really popular uh, first time I tried one. an IPA, I literally thought I may as well have just chewed on a handful of Panadol before I drank yeah, a beer. Like, sure. I, what the hell is going on? But it took me a while to like Little Creatures. I mean, that was once upon a time the Australian, you know, as far as craft beer went, that was probably one of the few ones that was readily available. And I, oh, yeah. I took me a while to um, grow an appreciation for it. Yeah, the first time I tried Little Creatures Pale was at um, the Edinburgh Gardens in Fitzroy used to have this, um, I mean, they still would, I guess, if it wasn't for the pandemic, but have this big festival, like it's a real hippie festival. Um, And one of my mates at uni was a pretty quirky dude um, and used to build shelving displays and stuff for the shop Ishka. I don't know how he got that gig. He wasn't like a trained like furniture maker or anything. He was like me. He was, you know, studying music at uni. He was just like kind of handy and uh-huh. had a bunch of hippie friends. And one of them said like, oh, I, I own Ishka. Can you make a bunch of shells for me? And that somehow led to him building sets and um, displays and, and stuff for this festival in the Edinburgh Gardens. And he was like, oh, I got free tickets. You should come. I'm like, all right. Went in there and Little Creatures Pale Ale was the beer that they were serving everywhere, like at, at, at this festival. And I'd never drank it before, and um, I hadn't really experienced like floral, hoppy kind of beers before. Um, I'd sort of started my move into nicer beers, but I, was, I, I kind of started on um, English beers. So I was drinking, like, I remember Witchwood Hobgoblin was one of the first sort of mind-blowing beers that I had, like, it was this, like, they call it a ruby ale. It's like a kind of darker red ale style thing um, from, like, an Irish brewery. Uh-huh. I think they're Irish. In, some, some, somewhere in the UK. Yep, yep, yep. UK and Ireland, I should say. Um, I don't want to make that mistake. <laughs> Ireland is definitely its own country. Um, but, um, yeah, so I hadn't really kind of come across that type of thing and it kind of blew my mind like I'm like this is so floral and fruity mm-hmm. and amazing and yeah it, like I think it really was um a gateway beer for so many people yeah yeah I think it was the bitterness for me that was it took some um getting used to having all the beers I'd tried pr- prior to that of the macro lagers being not bitter at all, yeah. despite some of them having the word bitter in their name. Um, yeah. And it's funny now going back to that beer because it, I, I think it's still the same beer, but it, it's, 
our palates have shifted so much and our lupulin yeah. threshold is, has grown so Once, high yep. that you have it now and it almost feels bland. Like not, I shouldn't yeah. say bland cool. because it's still a delicious yeah. beer. It's a yeah, really well-made well made American power, but it, it's, it's like we've, we've become so accustomed to these absolute bombs of hoppiness. Yeah. Um, that a more subtle yeah, <laughs> kind of, of classic American yeah. parallel is it's a different thing. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, so, I've uh, got a couple of questions. I don't know if yeah, you awesome. want to... Um, I would love to the answer some time. questions. The, the, yep, cool, let's answer some. So, um, Andrew's asking um, probably a, a common question when it comes to Nipah's uh, do you use hot bags or just chuck the hops straight in? I for dry definitely hopping? use oh. hot bags for the dry hop. Um, the first one I did was at that point one of the best beers I had made and I got about a third of the way through the keg and the dip tube clogged with hot, <laughs> hot material. Um, so then I like had to like pull the post off, pull out the dip tube, clear it, put it all back in, poured about half a glass and then it clogged again. And yes. I just didn't know how I was going to get around. I ended up having to um, rig up some weird siphon contraption from one keg into the other. Um, and in that transferring process, like obviously introducing oxygen and, and it just kind of lost its character and its flavour really quickly. And it was a very, very sad, um, sad time. Yep, I've, so, I've done that before too. Um, clogged the... Um, the, the dip tube in the keg and also yeah bottling yeah it just, it's, a, it's a pain so I think um, you do lose some utilization but it's that kind of you're weighing up it's worth for me losing a little bit of the character of your dry hop when you're kind of got that insurance policy against <laughs> clogging up your um clogging up your kegs clogging yeah. up your your um your bottles and definitely if you've ever have that happen to you? It's something you only want to go through once. Yeah, it's it's kind of tragic to, to yeah. lose so much really good beer. Yeah, um, over such an annoying kind of um, annoying little thing. Uh, we're at 96 degrees. We're getting there. Slowly getting up to the boil. Yeah, it's just um, sort of chugging along a bit today. The older. It's been a bit slow to get get up to temp, hasn't it? Hmm. Um, it was giving me some errors before. I might have to check. We, we knock these things around a little bit. Mm -hmm. We might have knocked something loose. And... Definitely well used. Um, earlier we had a question. Now, I don't know if you have these, this, uh, these numbers available. We, we were chatting earlier on about chloride to sulfate ratios. Um, oh, I can't remember who it was. I think Alan was asking about parts per million. Um, you know, yeah. people, people, people like numbers, I guess. Um, so I is, is, is that I go on ratio more than um, ppm. I've in in this particular batch, I've literally done nine grams of um, oh. there's a Alarm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've literally gone, um, I think it's like eight grams of calcium chloride to one gram of calcium sulfate, because um, we've already got like a higher um, chloride to sulfate um, ratio in the water here, the Altona water. Yeah, right. Um, so to hit that nine to one ratio, that's, that's kind of the way that I achieved it um, using the Brewer's Friends um, calculator. Um, I don't know what that is in parts per million. I, I wasn't really yeah. paying too much notice of it. I thought like if like we're it's, it's probably on the higher end. Three hundred um, putting ten grams of salts 50. into twenty litre batch. Yeah, but I mean I've I've done beers where I've burtonized the water yeah. and we're talking close to hundred grams in a forty litre batch of salts, like it's like seventy or eighty grams or something like that. So it's not um, going to kill you. But certainly for an IPA, you wouldn't be out of place. Usually on the, the sulfate side, up to th or, yeah, I'm off the top of my head here, so forgive me if I'm wrong. But 350 parts per million is not uncommon. So if you just transpose that to chloride, yeah. um, I mean that that feels about right. Obviously the sulfate level is much lower. You said 10 to 1, uh, wasn't yeah, it? Uh, yeah, nine to one. Nine to one. Nine to one. I, okay. I don't know why I decided on nine to one. <laughs> okay, but a lot, a lot more, a lot more <laughs> yeah. calcium. 
uh, chloride um, than, than Gibson. Um, but yeah, parts per million. Um, we'll probably find as well when we look back at the video. I said 10 to 1 at the start. Oh, you bet you may have. I'm, yeah, it was, it was so long ago. Who can remember? Yeah, it was a whole um, lifetime ago. There are, there's plenty of information out there um, on the net about NEPAs and the, um, the salts in particular. Um, just experiment and um, don't be afraid to use a lot, I suppose. Is there, um, I think for me know. at least that ratio is really important, but I also think having a little bit of sulfate in the water is yeah. important as well. As well, yeah. Just to give it a little bit of definition. I think it helps to have uh, some confidence in uh, water chemistry as well. I, I do find people do, um, numbers are great, but once you've got a bit of confidence about what, just what works, you don't have to, the numbers become less important. Yeah. Um, it's not really a satisfying answer, I yeah. know. Uh, and I mean, like, I, I've said, like, multiple times this video as well, I'm not a chemist. I'm not... Yeah, <laughs> I'm, you like, don't I'm, need to... Yeah. It's not something that you need to... It's probably something about. that another brewer would give you a really detailed answer to. Um, it's not something that I am by any means an yeah. expert in. I've kind of... I think there's so many different facets to brewing and there's so many different kind of levels of understanding in, in all these different areas that you... It'd be pretty hard to become really, like, well versed in all of yeah. them. So I think you, you kind of have to necessarily specialise to a degree. You need to know mm. enough about the different things to sort of be functional and be better. Yeah. But if you don't specialise in some way, yeah. you, you kind of it's easy to get kind of buried in information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, everyone has their own facets of the hobby that they enjoy. Some people are really into the science. Um, others are more uh, just into the process. Um, I think like you, I, the science is, is I struggle with, just that's me. So um, having a basic understanding of water chemistry as it relates to style. So IPAs, you know, uh, British, English beers, um, and then all the other styles, having an understanding of the base, kind of what works for that and then, and then that gives you the flexibility to make the same beer yeah. and invert the chloride to sulfate ratios. Yeah. Yeah. As an experiment. Um, to like so if, if you're like me, so I'm very much like about the flavour and and the um, the recipe design side of things. So I'm coming at it from more of a foodie angle than like a, um, a sort of science angle or like a kind of engineering sort of angle, which a lot of people are really into like building rigs and things like yeah. that. Um, so the way that I approach learning about these sorts of things is how is this going to impact the flavour? How is this going to impact the end products when I'm designing my recipes and designing all those things? So something like making the same recipe twice, keeping as many of the variables the same as you can, and just inverting the chloride to sulfate ratio will give you a really strong idea. Um, and you can do a side by side as well. Like you, you can um, compare the two and say, well, this is a lot sharper. This is a lot more defined. It's like the bitterness is more pronounced. This is a lot softer. It's the malt flavors come up a lot more. It's like richer. Um, you can get a really sort of instant idea as to how that particular component of brewing impacts the flavour and impacts the beer um, in terms of mouthfeel, in terms of aroma, in terms of flavour, in terms of all those things. Um, and I think that's probably going to be more useful for somebody who's not as, as kind of scientifically minded like myself um, in terms of how you're going to approach um, dealing with that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so for me, water chemistry is about dialing in your pH and hitting the right character. And that's kind of where it ends yep. for me. Yep. Like it, 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 I could go way deeper into that if I wanted to. And maybe one day I will. Like we've got the water book here by um, John Palmer. 
and Kaczynski, I think. Uh, Greg Kaczynski. Simon Kaczynski, yeah. Uh, someone, yep. Um, which us, uh, is like a book about that thick just on water as heavy. it relates to brewing beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I wanted to, I could attempt to read that. I'd probably struggle a fair bit with a lot of the ideas that it was exploring, but um, practically for me at the moment in terms of making the beers I want to do and, and having the degree of control over the process that I want to have, un like understanding how to hit the right pH and understanding how to get the sort of seasoning, for lack of better mm -hmm. terms, right, um, is, is what is helping me to achieve what I'm setting out to achieve. And, and mouthfeel is a big part of that as well. So, like, um, we're boiling. We're, going there. we're at the boil, finally. So I suppose this is, a, this is probably a long and rambly way of, <laughs> of saying, um, if numbers are important to you, unfortunately, we don't have very good, a very good answer um, other than um, do, if you, if, yeah, if you're really into your numbers and, and that's what interests you, then um, do the background research. Um, that book that Ben mentioned, Water, is a really good um, resource. Um, and having that background will inform you down the track for whatever style of beer you're making. Um, yeah. But uh, if, if I guess but brewers like Ben and I, it's more about having a basic understanding, you know, and not being, not trying to hit a particular number, just knowing, just knowing, you know, uh, the, uh, ratios and... and. And you're constantly learning as well. And each yeah. little bit of information that you pick up helps you to learn the next little bit of information. But like, I'm very much, um, I guess, <laughs> can't help but go philosophical sometimes. I'm, I guess I'm fairly Hegelian in my approach to, to these things. So like, um, the, the, the practice informs the theory. Mm -hmm. So, um, which in turn yeah. informs the practice. Yeah. Um, so, so you kind of, you're doing, um, you re you're reading all this information about like water chemistry and stuff, and then you're like, it's it's all very abstract. Yep. Um, until you actually apply it. Yep. Learn by doing. To the to the brew, and then that like something like I said before, like um, inverting the chloride to sulfate ratios in the, in the same recipe, and then um, comparing the difference. Like that's that's going to give you like a concrete, tangible understanding of what your um, of what these theory and these ideas that you've read do to the beer. And then if you go back and revisit that same stuff that you've read, it's going to take on new and different meaning because, it, because those words and those concepts are being informed by the, the actual practice of, of putting it in place. And then if you come across some new theory or some new kind of writing about that stuff, then the already existing theory and practice that you're bringing to that is going to help um, determine the way in which you understand that and then you can start to apply that and then it's this kind of I'm going to use a big word here dialectical relationship Ooh. between between these things it's like the 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 two things kind of feed each feed other, each other. And, yeah. and and grows to like kind of a better understanding, understanding. overall of, of what you're trying to do so so we hope we hope that was in some way. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, Alan, I'm a bit of a um, nerd, sorry. <laughs> that, no, and uh, Alan, you just, you just uh, said thanks. Um, no uh, worries, uh, Alan. No, don't. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with being a chemistry nerd. He's um, no. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, good. Yeah, we need them. Yeah, because yeah, I, I wouldn't know anymore. what I know if, yeah. if it wasn't for like having chemistry nerds around to pick their brains. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, and then you get the very basic sort of bare bones from them, and yep. then. Kind of run with that. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, the alternative water report. Yeah. So use use the water report as your base, and then and then yeah, just just sort of figure out your own targets based on. Well, the I, I guess a good example as well yeah. would be um, check pills. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So check so check pills. Um, so a lot of beer styles kind of evolved out of the water that they had access to in the areas. So like, I mean, the classic one is the stout in Dublin, right? Like. They, they couldn't make pale beer there because they didn't realise why, but it was because the carbonate levels in the water was so high that it was pulling the pH way out on all their mashes. But when they found by using darker roasted grains 
um, in their brews, the beers were coming out a lot better and that's because the roasted grains was pulling the pH back down again into a good range for the, um, for the mash to happen. So in, in um, Pilsen in Czechoslovakia, um, the water was extremely soft, like hardly any mineral content whatsoever. Um, and as a result of that, A, they were able to make beers probably paler than it ever been, well, definitely paler than it ever been made before, but also the mouthfeel and the body of those beers was really soft and gentle and, and um, almost like water, like, like just really kind of, um, it's a unique mouthfeel. So if, if you're trying to make a Czech pills, um, you don't want to be adding large amounts of salts to your water because that's going to harden up the water and completely throw the mouthfeel off. So um, the bare minimum you can get in there to get the, the kind of the flavorings right is, is sort of what you're trying to achieve and then using acids to get your pH to where it needs to be. So there's like, there's all these different kind of things that, um, that definitely come into play. With this sort of stuff. Don't mind me, I'm, I'm oh, replying fixing, to fixing questions in the chat. On <laughs> oh, cool. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, did not think we were going to be going into Hegelian dialectics. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise for that. I've been reading some philosophy lately and, and it's kind of making my thought processes take a certain shape. <laughs> so I apologise for that. Never apologise for being a, a, a philosophy nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Any kind of nerd. Um, so yeah, we had a question earlier. I'm just replying to it now. Uh, dry yeast for New England styles, which we stock. Yes, um, the New England's. Um, I haven't used it yet. Neither have I. <laughs> so I can't, so I I can't um, talk yeah, to it. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of people have been using it and having good results. I think Matt might have knocked out a few lefty juices back when we had the wall of beer running um, with the with the yeast, and I think that came they came out really good. Um, I mean, it's, it's a proprietary strain of, of yeast designed to make that type of beer. Um, so I don't know whether it's of the flocculent it, or non-flocculent yep, variety. Yep. Um, but obviously but they, they feel it suits the style, so whatever. And, it's, uh, and yeah, people are having good results with them. Like we've sent out a lot of those, um, particularly with the work kits. A lot of people go for the dry yeast with the work kits because it's a little bit easier to manage. Yeah. You don't have to kind of worry about doing starters and, and uh, babying your yeast as much as with the liquid yeast. So um, yeah, people are getting really good results with it. So uh, yeah, uh, Dan Star make that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I should I should um, do a beer with it actually. Just, yeah. Just to kind of have a better answer oh, yeah. <laughs> when people ask about one of the products we sell. Yeah. Start. Yeah. And I unfortunately I can't post links. The chat won't allow me to do that. So. Um, um, you'll have to jump on our website, just do a search for New England, I'm pretty sure it'll come up. We could probably Google it to see um, how they describe it in terms of flocculation and... and yeah, stuff like that. I'm sure that information is out there. Um, so I'm just going through some of the other questions mm -hmm. here. Someone was asking about a dip tube. Mm -hmm. it was Caltas. As in like, what is a dip tube or...? Um, no, Lindsay, do you recommend having a floating dip tube in the keg instead, That's not a bad idea. To picking, uh, instead of picking up hazy beer from the bottom? That's a really good idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously the new uni tanks are designed with floating dip tubes, um, the Fermozillas and the Fermenter Kings. Um, Which makes them really good for brewing these types of beers, because you probably yeah. could get away with not using hot bags in that instance, because you're running the beer from the top, leaving all the hop gunk in the bottom, and then you're filling your keg without pulling all that hop gunk, hop gunk with it. Um, so yeah, that would be a really good, um, really good option. Yeah. Plus, it gives you the capability of, um, with a lot of those ones with the removable yeast bottle, Yes. You can use yeah, those to dry hop your beer um, with minimal oxygen exposure, which is something that we haven't really touched on, but mm. is definitely worth touching on. So I'm glad that that question was yeah. asked. Yeah, and I think there's... there's um, um, because yeah. oxygen and hops are enemies. So the less oxygen exposure you can give this wort from the... Like, so you obviously you need some for the initial fermentation, but from the point that you pitch your yeast in this beer, 
you should be avoiding oxygen like the plague, basically. Um, it's what's going to knock the life out of the beer. So any steps you can take to minimise that is good. Um, and like I said, those um, uni tanks, like your Firmzillas, your, I don't know what the other one's called. They, they change them every other week, it's, yeah, <laughs> it they, feels like. Yeah, they do like. update them. Um, but yeah, th those kind of uni tank fermenters, which are becoming more and more popular, um, are really, really good options um, for brewing these type of beers. And if you already have one of those and you're watching this and thinking, oh, I might have a crack at uh, brewing this, then uh, that's probably not a bad, yeah. not a bad yeah. move. We have a few people chiming in. Yeah, if anyone out there has fermented, well, there was also a question about fermenting under pressure. Um, I don't know if that's necess absolutely necessary, but like Ben was saying about the oxygen uh, side of things, these beers do tend to age well, not age, because you, you, you notice the age quicker. The, the hops do they would drop off a shelf after a certain point. Um, yeah. And, part and of the more oxygen that's, that's the, been exposed to the beer, the quicker that's going to happen. That, that's going to happen. So if you can ferment in a uni tank, that can be sealed and under pressure. Presumably, the theory goes that less, there's no oxygen getting in, so you'll get a beer that will be fresher for longer. So Yeah, yeah under um, pressure is a really good way to limit oxygen because yeah. the, it's under pressure by CO2. Yes, yeah. So I, I, you know, there's a lot of, uh, again, fermenting under pressure is, is very um, popular at the moment. Um, I would be fermenting a beer like this, if I could, if I had the, the means to, under pressure, less for the time saving. Yeah. Um, that's the other reason people ferment under pressure is because you can make, for example, lagers a lot quicker. Um, I wouldn't really, I mean, it's an ale, I, I, I'm generally not in a huge hurry to drink my beers anyway. So that's less so important, but it's more about keeping the beer out of uh, oxygen. So mm. The one thing I would be considering with that as well um, is the ester character from a lot of these yeasts does play a nice kind of supporting role uh, in, in terms of the, the kind of fruity flavours. So like having like some bit of fruity esters from the yeast, a bit of fruitiness in this case from the mm -hmm. oats, then you've also got like the fruitiness from the hops. Um, if you're fermenting under pressure, it can inhibit ester production. So keep that in mind, um, I guess. You might not want it at as high a pressure as, as what you would say a, a Pilsner or something, if, if you're wanting to. In which case you would want to inhibit ester production. Um, so uh -huh. that's something to consider as well. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so Lindsay says he was, well, they were talking about um, uh, dip tube floating in the keg. So I guess, again, same yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. There are some supply issues, I think, at the moment with lots of lots of different stock. I think there was some mentioned earlier that there, people are having issues supplying certain products. When that's, that's I mean, we're like, having issues yeah, supplying everyone is, at all it's, homebrew it's, shops. And the, as, that's I the think, way the world is. Right um, now. I might have mentioned it earlier in the stream, but OzPost is saying five days for Express at the moment yeah. and significantly longer for regular posts. So um, that's from us to you guys, um, so so getting from our supplies to us is a similar kind of delay. So yeah. um, we're, we're doing the best we can, but yeah. um, I think no, everyone's um, most people have been really understanding and patient, which is really cool. Um, we're we're all in the same boat, right? We're all, yeah. we're all sort of experiencing the same thing. So just got to make do best we can. Um, so I think yeah. I think Oz Post in in uh, Melbourne aren't even sorting regular posts in Melbourne. I heard, so, yeah. So they, they, um, a lot of what we're sending, if it's within Melbourne, if it's regular post, um, they, it doesn't even get scanned here. It just gets chucked in the truck, taken up to Sydney, Sydney. and sorted there, and then comes back down. Yeah. So, um, so even if we're sending to a, the next suburb, it's got to go to Sydney. Got to go via Sydney. Or going or, by Sydney yeah, yeah. and then coming back. So um, that's worth considering as well if you are ordering things. Um, if, if it's not that much more to go express, you're likely to get it within a week express, whereas you, it may be sort of up to a month to regular post, depending on luck and a variety of other things. So something worth considering. Yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Oh, Alan, so Alan is um, saying he's used the 
Danstar New England strain. Oh, medium flocculating, so oh, it's in the middle. Interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's sort of like um, the 1056, the YS 1056 is a medium flocculator as well. Yeah, so I was just saying, um, the person who asked the question, oh, I'm sorry, Andrew, it was Andrew. The Bry 97 as well, I guess you could use. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Even, um, I know some people have used SO4, which is yes, the, the yeah. um, British Alice to um, reasonably good effect. I've actually taken to using British yeasts for all of my hoppy beers, regardless of whether I'm doing a New England or not. Started doing that too. Kind of for what the reason I was saying before, like that, I think the slight fruity esters you get from them really complements the mm. hops in a nice way. And, and it, I, I find that the malt gets a little bit more love yep. as well from them. I just generally find that I get a beer that I like more. Yep. I think the the classic sort of American, like your 1056 or your US 05 and stuff, it, it can kind of be a bit muting to the beer. Like it kind of takes a bit of the, um, mm. bit of the pizzazz out of it. Okay, interesting. Um, and I think as well, I brew a lot of lagers, so yeast character in lagers is next to non-existent. So I well, guess yes. if I'm making an ale, it's nice to kind of go out of <laughs> out of the archetype. And then... Yeah, uh, that is that is a good point for you know anyone who we were making this point earlier too about experimenting, trying different ingredients, uh, the yeast as well. You don't have to be. I'm stepping outside of Nipahs here, but uh, confined to the. US 05 for American hoppy beers sort of um, mindset. Um, in fact, Stone, is it Stone or they, they're yeah, used one of the big strain? ones. One of the big, one of the big oh, ones. Firestone and Walker, I think. Firestone Walker, uh, probably, probably. I a few think they of them. used like 1968 or like one of yeah. those kind of really flocculent, really kind of very English. Very English, strains. yes, which are 1968. Um, and it's, I think, since mutated or evolved and it's now their house strain, but it's based on an English. Style. So don't be afraid to use English style yeasts in American hoppy beers. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, like I've been using Nottingham for all of my sort of pails and IPAs and stuff for mm -hmm. years now, just because Jeff, who works here, got me onto it. Yeah, he's a bit naughty fan. I'm like, this is yeah. actually really good. Yeah. <laughs> and I um, ma much prefer it to the kind of conventional ones, but again, it's what you like. Yep. <laughs> Um, and I only know that I prefer it because I did it both ways. <laughs> so um, it, it, it really does come down to experimentation, figuring out what you like and, and then doing that. Um, yeah. You, you, you're making, however much you're making at a time, not everyone's doing 20 litre batches. Um, a lot of people are moving to smaller batch sizes now, which is really cool, I think. Yeah. Um, yep. Because, you know, why should you have to do 20 litres just because that's the convention? Like, yeah, I've, I've the same started brewing a lot less. Just trying to get through a whole keg is not uh, yeah. <laughs> something I can do anymore. Um, so, so, so you know, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. um, brew what you want. Do but you, you want. you're going to be making an amount of beer. You want it to be an amount of beer that you like. So, figure out what you do like, how to achieve it, and then do more of that. Cool. So we are about to hit the twelve thirty mark. Yeah. Um, I reckon we can probably, um, I mean, if, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer, yeah. but otherwise, yeah. like, I reckon we're probably, all that's going to happen now is it's going to finish boiling. Um, I've got 40 grams of citra, which I'm going to chuck in the cube. Um, and then I'll use a hose, run it down into the cube while it's boiling and then clean everything up. Yep. That's it. Um, so if anyone, again, has any um, interest in no chilling or cubing, we do have a video about that. Just, just search our... Um, YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching this demo later in time, um, the non-live version, I'll put a link up there uh, and they'll take you straight to it. Um, but yeah, as Ben said, we're going to finish the boil, dry hops go in as per the recipe and then just cube. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, I think we sort of covered We covered a basics. lot of ground today. <laughs> like we, yeah. we haven't even covered like what is a mash? What like we we've not done any sort of yeah process specific yeah. like brewing stuff. It's just been pure Nipah for the Nipahs, whole yes. three hours. So. so hopefully we haven't lost anyone. This is probably more suited for intermediate brewers who have been brewing for some time and are, and are sort of looking at particular styles. Now we do have our brew in a bag video, of course, which Ben, that guy, also stars in. So that covers a lot of the very basic, just in a very fundamental sort of overview kind of way, but. 
I'm sure down the track we'll um, revisit John, some of John's, John's great at um, feeding my um, desire to be the centre of attention. He has <laughs> lots of opportunities to do it. I do what I can. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, well, I guess we might wrap things up. Yeah, I think. think. Cool. Uh, thanks, Hapes, for hanging out. Yeah. Um, and, um, and for the questions as well, because I think like, there was definitely some stuff that we wouldn't have covered had it not been for the questions. So um, it, it really does sort of um, help a lot yeah. um, um, for yeah. everyone, not just for us, for, um, for the crew. It does. We're too. Definitely like um, as, as these streams progress in, um, we get ahead around it and progress in quality and whatnot, where I'm finding that you know, people are more engaged in the chat, which we like to see. I really appreciate everyone's um, chiming in as well, helping each other out. I'd like to see that too, yeah. fostering a supporting community. So um, thanks a lot, everyone. And um, keep an eye on our website. We'll be announcing what I think uh, we're planning the streams coming up next hell and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Going, maybe. Uh, we've got something that. in the works we've, we've got, got something in the works uh, check out the website uh, there's a section on demos you can find our upcoming uh, schedule on there and and the mm. social media as well um, Facebook media, and Instagram yes. it'll all be, it'll all be subscribe to the newsletter uh, that's always a good way to get a head start uh, a jump on any um, any news that's coming up we tend to announce it in the newsletter first um, so you can do that on the actually, website I don't, know, I don't know if I promoted this demo on Instagram actually yeah, right, yeah. Like, we, that's we my have bad. Been... Sorry. Sorry to all the people that aren't watching right now because I, I didn't say it on Instagram. I apologise. <laughs> apologise. You'll never see my fans. apology, but... <laughs> well, yeah, been, well, we have been, as everyone understands, the, the store's been under the pump. <laughs> yes. So uh, a few things have um, um, been harder on the social media side to stay on top of. But we do appreciate everyone's patience and support and... Uh, we do hope that everyone yeah, is staying well out there in these times. And um, thank you very much for watching. Yeah, see you soon. See you later. Dun, dun, dun. Got to press the button. Bye bye.